I made a video on infinite loops that cause illegal game states, and with this video I'll cover infinite loops that are totally legal in Yu-Gi-Oh! and can win you the game. In this list we'll try to cover 10 cards which cause infinite loops in legal game states, if not completely legal with the ban list. A lot of these cards are going to be banned cards. And at number 10 we have Flintlock. Now this card is able to cause an infinite loop with another copy of itself and Flint. Flintlock has the effect where it can move the equip spell card Flint to any other monster on the field, and not once per turn. It does have a once per turn effect of moving Flint to itself though. So if you move Flint to another copy of Flintlock, the other Flintlock can just move it back to the original Flintlock, and they can just both keep on moving Flint between each other infinitely. And this movement counts as the equipping and equip card, so if you have morale boosts out on the field, you'll gain a thousand life points every time you move Flint and you can gain an infinite amount of life points during your turn with this combo. Or, if you combine it with Fire Princess, who inflicts 500 points of damage every time you gain life points, you can OTK your opponent with this infinite life point gain loop. The loop itself requires three cards, infinitely gaining life points requires four cards, and actually being able to OTK your opponent requires five cards. So it's not the most consistent infinite loop in the world, and that's why it's only at number 10. Number 9, Primal Seed. This card allows you to infinitely recycle one removed from play card. Primal Seed has the effect where you can only activate it if you have Blackluster Soldier Envy of the Beginning or Chaos Emperor Dragon Envoy of the End on the field. You can add two removed from play cards to your hand. So in order to set up the loop, you need to get BLS on the field, a card that banishes all cards like Macro Cosmos or Banisher of the Radiance, and have two copies of Primal Seed in your hand, plus the card you want to loop. In the example in the video, I'm using Tremendous Fire in order to OTK my opponent. So I just use Tremendous Fire to inflict 500 points of damage to my opponent, then Tremendous Fire will be banished due to Radiance's effect. And then I use Primal Seed to recover Tremendous Fire, and then use it again. And then I use my second Primal Seed to recover Tremendous Fire, and the first copy of Primal Seed. Then I can just use Tremendous Fire, and then Primal Seed to recover a Tremendous Fire and Primal Seed. And you can just do this as many times as you want. With this loop, you can technically recycle any card, so you can also give your monsters infinite attack if you recycle an attack boosting spell card. It's just, Tremendous Fire was the quickest way to OTK my opponent for this video. In order to set up this loop, you need four cards. One specific card on the field, two specific spell cards in your hand, and a way to banish all cards. Which makes this loop not at all consistent, and that's why it's only at number 9. Number 8, Red Eyes Flare Metal Dragon. This card has the effect where each time your opponent activates an effect, you immediately inflict 500 damage. One of the more popular ways to use this card in a practical duel is if your opponent brings out Beals on their side of the field. Beals has the effect where it gains attack equal to the damage you take. So if your opponent has Beals out and they activate any effect while you have Flare Metal Dragon, it'll start an infinite loop that will kill your opponent. As Beals will gain 500 attack, which will cause Flare Metal Dragon to inflict 500 damage, which will then cause Beals to gain 500 attack, and then Flare Metal Dragon will then inflict 500 damage, and it will just repeat until your opponent loses. Now, there is a way to force an infinite loop with a Red Eyes Flare Metal Dragon without relying on your opponent having Beals, or giving your opponent a Beals. If you give your opponent a Gelin Duo with the effect of Summon Sorceress, and you have Red Eyes Flare Metal Dragon on your side of the field, you can wait for your opponent to activate an effect, which will then cause Flare Metal Dragon to inflict 500 damage. Gelin Duo has the effect where if you take damage, this card is destroyed, but its effect will be negated on your opponent due to Summon Sorcerer's effect, so it won't actually destroy itself, but Flare Metal Dragon will chain to its effect trying to go off and inflict 500 damage which will then cause its effect to try to go off again, but will be negated and will stay on the field. And then Flare Metal Dragon will inflict 500 more damage. So with this combo, a much easier to pull off combo since Summon Sorceress can give it to your opponent straight from your deck, and is easy to bring out, you can cause an infinite loop to OTK your opponent. Number 7, Colossal Fighter. Colossal Fighter is a synchro monster who has the effect where if it's destroyed by battle, you can special summon a warrior type monster from your graveyard. Colossal Fighter himself is a warrior type monster, and can target itself. 
Now, in order to cause the infinite loop, you need to have rainbow life, and your opponent needs to have a monster with a higher attack than Colossal Fighter, which can be accomplished by giving your opponent a kaiju. Colossal Fighter then can just attack into the higher attack monster and destroy itself, and then bring itself back, and then you'll gain life points equal to the damage he took due to rainbow life's effect, and you can just repeat this as many times per turn as you want, allowing you to gain an infinite amount of life points. And because this combo is so easy to set up, you just need one trap card and a way to bring out Colossal Fighter, and for your opponent to have a stronger monster, which you can just give them, it's actually kind of a problem for some sanctioned events, to the point where Rainbow Life is routinely banned for the World Championship tournaments. It used to be you could OTK with this loop if you were to equip Armory Arm to one of your opponent's monsters and attack into it. Armory Arm inflicts damage to your opponent equal to the attack of the monster destroyed by the monster this card is equipped to, which works if you equip it to one of your opponent's monsters and then attack into it. But they create a special ruling that states the monster must be in the graveyard for the effect to apply. And since Colossal Fighter's special summon itself after being destroyed, the damage never actually takes effect. So in order for this combo to work, you need two copies of Colossal Fighter, which is a lot more difficult to pull off. Number 6. Manticore of Darkness. This card has been involved in a lot of loops in the past, but I'm only going to mention two of them for this video. Manticore has the effect where if it's sent to the graveyard, you can send a beast, beast warrior, or wing beast type monster you control or in your hand to the graveyard to special summon this card from the graveyard during the end phase. Since this card itself is a beast warrior type monster and its effect is not once per turn, if you manage to get one Manticore in the graveyard and one in your hand, you can infinitely special summon one Manticore by sending the other one to the graveyard. Now, in order to OTK with this card, you can combine it with Archfiend Eater and Backfire. Archfiend Eater has the effect where during the end phase, you can destroy one monster you control to special summon this card, and not once per turn. Backfire has the effect to inflict 500 damage to your opponent every time a fire type monster is destroyed. So, if you have Archfiend Eater in the graveyard and Manticore on the field with Backfire, during the end phase, Archfiend Eater can destroy Manticore to bring itself out, which will cause Backfire to inflict 500 damage to your opponent. And then Manticore can send Eater to the graveyard to bring itself out. And then Eater can activate its effect, since it's still the end phase, to destroy Manticore and bring itself back out. And this can happen an infinite amount of times, which can OTK your opponent with the Backfire's damage. This combo requires three cards to set up, so it's not that inconsistent. More recently, when Zodiacs were at full power, if your opponent activated a Max C, you could use the Zodiacs to search out two copies of Manticore, since they were Beast Warrior type monsters. And if you could just send one to the graveyard, you could infinitely special summon them during your end phase to cause your opponent to draw every card in their deck. And since Max C was a pretty good counter to Zodiacs, some people were signing in two Manticores of Darkness in order to deck out their opponents who used Max C. Number 5, Knight Assailant. This card has two effects. First effect is unimportant for this loop. Its second effect is, whenever this card is sent from your hand to the graveyard, you can add another flip monster from your graveyard to your hand. Since Knight Assailant himself is a flip monster, you can add a second copy of it from your graveyard to your hand. So with two Knight Assailants, you have infinite discard fodder, as one can just add the other one back to your hand if discarded. If combined with a card like Snipe Hunter, whose effect is to discard a card to potentially destroy one card on the field as many times per turn as you want, you could infinitely clear out your opponent's board. And that's why Knight Assailant is limited. This is one of those cards on the list who's broken with multiple copies of it in your deck, but is completely fine if there's only allowed one copy in your deck. Number 4, Firewall Dragon. Now this card has two effects. Uh, I'm only going to talk about its second effect, though. Its second effect is if a card this card points to goes to the graveyard, you can special summon a monster from your hand, and this effect is not once per turn. So, if combined with a card like a Assault Core, whose effect is that if this card is sent to the graveyard, you can add another Union monster from your graveyard to your hand, and a card like Toon Cannon Soldier, who allows you to tribute a monster to inflict 500 damage to your opponent, as long as you have one other monster in your hand, you can infinitely cycle between two assault cores, recycling themselves, and then being special summoned with Firewall Dragon. And because of this, 
a solid core got limited so it couldn't loop itself. Kind of like why Knight Assailant was limited. But then when Firewall Dragon got banned, they put a salt core back to unlimited, since it was only really a problem as long as Firewall Dragon existed. Unlike Knight Assailant, who was useful in much more situations. The thing with Firewall though, is it could allow other infinite loops and not just with the salt core. And that's why this car got banned. He was too easy to bring out and caused too many infinite loops which could be done on your first turn to win. And as the most recent card on this list to come out, this goes to show you that they are not at all afraid of still printing cards which cause infinite loops, and they have definitely not learned their lessons from all these other past cards. Number 3, Samsara Lotus. This card can be used in a whole bunch of different infinite loops, but for this video, I'm going to use a more gimmicky one. Samsara Lotus has the effect where, during the end phase, if you control no spell and traps, you can special summon this card, and this effect is not once per turn. So, if you can infinitely destroy the card with a card like King Tiger Wangu, and have another card like Genix Ally Bell Flame, who gains a counter every time a card is destroyed, which increases attack by 100 and inflicts 300 damage to your opponent for every counter it has if it's destroyed by battle. You can gain an infinite amount of stacks with Samsara Lotus and King Tiger Wangu, infinitely destroying and reviving itself. This is not really the best combo in the world, and there are other ways to abuse this effect, and in more practical ways, but I think this one is funny. Samsara Lotus is currently banned for some consistent loop it was used in, but it can also be used in this gimmicky one I just showed in this video. Number 2, Ultimate Offering. This card has the effect where you can pay 500 life points to normal summon an additional time, and this effect is not once per turn. Now, there are many ways to infinite loop with this effect, but the one I'm going to show in this video is a little simple. What you can do is summon Athena to the field, have Ultimate Offering up, and use it to normal summon Honest from your hand, which will activate Athena's first effect to inflict 600 damage to your opponent since a Fairy-type monster was summoned. Then you can use Honest's effect to send himself back to your hand. Then use Ultimate Offering to pay 500 life points to normal summon it, which will activate Athena's effect to do damage again. And then you can just activate Honest to send it back to your hand. Since you're doing 600 damage every time this interaction takes place, while only paying 500, if you started out with even life points, you can OTK your opponent with this loop. But since you do have to pay 500 life points every time you use Ultimate Offering, it's not really an infinite loop, since you can run out of life points. That is, unless you use the Mysterious Puppeteer, who has the effect to gain 500 life points every time a monster is normal summoned which then allows Ultimate Offering to enter Infinite Loop territory. Ultimate Offering is an incredibly strong card even outside of this loop, and that's why this card is banned. And at number 1, Butterfly Dagger Elma, a card basically on the ban list because of how easy it causes infinite loops. Elma has the effect to increase the attack of the monster it's equipped to by 300. Its second effect is, if sent to the graveyard while equipped, you can just return it to your hand. So if used on a card like Gear Free the Iron Knight, who has the effect to destroy any equipped card equipped to it, you can infinitely activate Butterfly Dagger Elma, have it destroyed and sent to the graveyard, and then return it to your hand. And if this is combined with a spell counter card, like Royal Magical Library, you can create an infinite amount of spell counters, which can allow you to draw through your entire deck in one turn. Now, there's actually a lot of ways to use Butterfly Dagger Elma's ability to infinitely recycle itself in other infinite loops, and other ways besides just Gear Free the Iron Knight, and that's why this card is banned. Being able to return to the hand with no cost after being destroyed on the field is too powerful, and no other card in the game has a similar effect, without some kind of heavy restriction, or at least a once per turn clause. You'll notice that pretty much all of these effects in this video are viable only because they don't have once per turn clauses. Like Treeborn Frog used to be used how Samsara Lotus is used, until it got a text change to change its effect to once per turn. So really, they could fix pretty much all of these cards by just adding a once per turn to the card. And they do occasionally go back and do just that, like they did with Treeborn Frog. And descending from the heavens at number 10 are the Egyptian God cards. Obelisk the Tormentor, Slifer the Sky Dragon, and the Winged Dragon of Ra. 
But if you're a fan of Yu-Gi-Oh memes, you might know these cards better as Slifer the Executive Producer, Mega Ultra Chicken, and the god that Kaiba would sacrifice in order to summon the Blue-Eyes White Dragon and change his future. In the case of the Executive Producer and the Mega Ultra Chicken, these memes were brought to popularity by the Yu-Gi-Oh! The Abridge series, a parody of the original Yu-Gi-Oh! anime made by Little Karibo that gave funny nicknames to all of the Egyptian god cards other than Obelisk. Slifer was named the Executive Producer in the Abridged series as a nod to the fact that in the Yu-Gi-Oh! anime, Slifer was renamed from Osiris the Sky Dragon, which references an actual Egyptian god, to Slifer the Sky Dragon, which is a reference to Roger Slifer, who co-produced the four kids anime series. And this official English translation of the card has stuck to the point where Slifer the Sky Dragon is still named Slifer to this very day. Ra, on the other hand, was named Mega Ultra Chicken as a reference to Ultra Mega Chicken from Aqua Teen Hunger Force. And while Obelisk wasn't renamed in the Abridged series, it still has its own iconic memes associated with it, such as the previously mentioned Kaiba sacrificing a god, a reaction image that comes with the subtitle Japanese dub of the original anime that's often used with funny captions, oftentimes even replacing the word god with another thing to be sacrificed. In fact, all of the Egyptian gods actually have quite a few memes associated with them. In the previous video, we talked about how iconic the Dark Magician, Blue Eyes White Dragon, and Exodia pieces are to people's childhood in the game's early identity, and Egyptian god cards are no different, especially since, in the anime, they acted as the ultimate boss monsters. Because each of the Egyptian gods held an absurd amount of power that just wasn't present on monsters in the early days of Yu-Gi-Oh! So when the Egyptian god cards were showcased in the anime as monsters that were unaffected by card effects that could reach impossibly high attack points, they submitted themselves as some of the coolest cards in the game, and ones that people were desperate to try for themselves making them so well-loved to the point where, to this day, you will see the Egyptian god cards of reference in both Yu-Gi-Oh! and non-Yu-Gi-Oh! memes since they're such an important part of people's childhood, to the point where, just like with Exodia, people are willing to play entire decks whose sole purpose is just to try to bring out the Egyptian gods. However, those players will often find themselves losing quite a few duels, because in the actual card game, the Egyptian gods never really reached the same status as their anime counterparts since they were heavily downgraded and oftentimes not worth the three tributes you needed to summon them. But what the Egyptian god cards represented is still a really important part of the game, even though they don't see much play themselves. Because in the modern era, there are a ton of different boss monsters that can show you what it feels like to bring out a god. Some people will even come up with summoning chants for their favorite boss monsters, just like how you had to know the ancient chant in order to properly summon the winged dragon of Ra. While the god cards rarely see actual play, there's no doubt that they've cemented themselves in the hearts and minds of a ton of different players. And even if you don't care about the Egyptian gods themselves, it's pretty likely that you have a monster that you cherish and revere as the ultimate boss of your deck. And summoning to number 9 is Endymion, the Mighty Master of Magic, the boss monster of the Endymion archetype that's managed to reach meme status alongside Nirvana High Paladin due to their ridiculously long card text. Power creep is a normal part of games, and Yu-Gi-Oh! is no different. The cards available have grown steadily more complex and more powerful since The Legend of Blue Eyes White Dragon, but for anyone that's used to the simplicity of cards like Pot of Greed or Monster Reborn, it's a shock to see just how complicated cards have become. And Endymion and Nirvana High Paladin are idols of complexity due to them having the most text out of any cards in the game, which makes them appear really complicated and difficult to parse at first glance. So much so that both of these cards were memed on for a while to show how wild the modern game has become. Nirvana High Paladin is even stated as one of the biggest reasons MBT and RJ's descendants went back in time to start the junior journey to stop Yu-Gi-Oh from being so complex. And it's honestly hard to blame them. Modern Yu-Gi-Oh is fairly difficult to understand and sometimes incredibly convoluted. And sometimes even reading the card text doesn't give you full understanding of what the card does. But in order to survive the Yu-Gi-Oh metagame, you need a good understanding of both your cards as well as your opponents. And not knowing small details can lead you to making some big mistakes. And it's these mistakes that have also led to the idea that Yu-Gi-Oh! players don't read cards. Because whether or not you're a pro or a casual player, there's probably been a time when you've tried to pop an indestructible boss monster, or you've tried to ash a Cherubini, or maybe you've tried to negate your opponent's normal spell with an MST. And when those things happen, some players will joke with others that they can't read because they missed something vitally important that made them misplay, and due to how complex the game is, this happens so frequently that Yu-Gi-Oh! players not reading is now just a universal way to lightly poke fun at others or to laugh at yourself for making mistakes. But, if you don't want to get caught off guard by these small but game determinative errors, it's important that you read cards carefully and understand their role in the particular decks. So, for anyone that hasn't yet, let's read Endymion together. Endymion is a level 7 dark spellcaster that happens to be a pendulum monster. This means that you can either summon it out of the field as a monster, or you can activate it in the pendulum scale in order to gain access to its pendulum effect, and use its scale for a pendulum summon. 
As a pendulum scale, Endymion is treated similarly to continuous spells, and actually only has one effect, but it's split into multiple parts. By paying a cost of removing 6 spell counters from your field, you can special summon Endymion from your pendulum zone. Then you must count the number of cards you control that you can possibly have a spell counter on them, because not all cards can have them on them, they have to have an effect which says they can, and destroy up to that many cards on the field. Then, if you do that, you must place a spell counter on Endymion for each card that was destroyed, and this effect has a hard once per turn, so you can't use it multiple times with different copies. Essentially, if you can pay the cost of 6 spell counters, Endymion has the potential to be able to destroy a ton of cards on the field while Special summoning himself out from the scale, which makes this effect amazing for wiping away your opponent's board to clear the way for an OTK. As a monster, however, Endymion's second effect box applies instead. This text box has three effects. The first one can be activated whenever a spell or trap card or effect is activated, and allows you to return any card you control that has a spell counter on it to your hand to negate the activation and destroy that spell or trap card. Then, you can place spell counters onto Endymion equal to the number of spell counters that card you return to your hand had. This is a huge benefit, because while Endymion has a spell counter on it as a monster, your opponent can't target it or destroy it with card effects. And if it's destroyed by battle while it has a spell counter on it, you get to add any normal spell card from your deck to your hand. So, next time you're up against an Endymion strategy, you can be safe in knowing that you're a Yu-Gi-Oh player that actually reads. Although, this is pretty unlikely to happen, since it's been forever since Endymion and Nirvana High Paladin have actually seen competitive play. But, the meme of Yu-Gi-Oh players not reading will forever be an eternal concept, so long as new cards with new weird details and rulings continue to be released. Just make sure to ask judges about things you need to know. Sharing into number 8 is Necro Valley, a representative of the Gravekeeper's archetype, which became a big meme thanks to Farfa, one of the biggest streamers in the Yu-Gi-Oh community. You see, this particular meme was coined during a Twitch stream, as Farfa lamented at how bad most Yu-Gi-Oh memes in the modern era are, since a lot of the most popular memes are just reaction images with some kind of caption. So, to make fun of these terrible memes, Farfa created one of his own with an image of Spongebob seemingly angry that his opponent has drawn a good card, a feeling that every player can sympathize with. And then, to make fun of how overused and overshared memes were, the image was compressed, deep fried, and given a number of different modifications and watermarks, and was made to be so unfunny that it came around to actually being funny again which resulted in this abomination that coined the iconic phrase, share if you play Gravekeepers. Now, if this phrase had been about any other deck, it might have just died with this meme. But a number of different factors kept this meme alive and even made it entirely synonymous with the Gravekeepers as a deck, to the point where some people will actually just call the deck, share if you play. The biggest factor though was that at the time this meme was released, Gravekeeper was a decently viable rogue strategy due to its synergy with Dragoon. And because it was capable of shutting down the graveyard with Necro Valley, which easily countered decks like Tribrigade and Drytron. And because people were likely to see the deck, it meant they would just casually say the phrase, share if you play Gravekeepers as an inside joke to reference the meme. This was further accelerated as other streamer and content creators, such as MPT Yu-Gi-Oh, would spread the meme to their chats, and culminated in an incredibly funny Twitch clip where MPT managed to defeat Gravekeepers in a tournament, capping off his victory with a loud and proud, share if you play Gravekeepers. Overall, it's really funny how a joke to make fun of bad memes ended up becoming a widespread meme in and of itself. And while the opportunity to say this meme has become a lot rarer due to the Gravekeepers no longer being viable, it's still ingrained in the minds of a ton of players as an almost Pavlovian response to Necro Valley. And Slytherin into number 7 is Predaplan Verte Anaconda, a card that reached meme status due to how many problems making Verte can solve. You see, Yu-Gi-Oh! is a difficult game filled with a ton of different options and choices. Whether it's deck building or while you're actually in a duel, and in order to win games, you have to build the right end boards and play around hand traps and board breakers your opponent likely has. But in some situations, you don't really have a choice and you're forced to play a line that is likely to lose to an opponent's interruption, leaving you with nothing. And in these situations, it's important to have a plan B in mind in case your starter is Veilard. And for a lot of decks, the best backup plan available was to play Verte Anaconda, alongside Dragoon or DPE in their extra deck, since in order to get access to these powerful boss monsters, you just had to commit two effect monsters to the field to link into Verte. So, if your main play was interrupted, you could just make Verte. Or if you wanted to play around certain hand traps, you could just make Verte. Or if you had no other play, you could just make Verte. This culminated into King Scarlet Yu-Gi-Oh! creating an entire song dedicated to Verte's problem-solving capabilities, which showed that no matter what situation you were in, you could just make Verte in order to get out of it. And because of how applicable Verte was to almost every situation in Yu-Gi-Oh!, people started using it to apply to problems that existed outside the game, just like in King Scarlet Song. If you crash a car or were in a fight, you can just make Verte in order to get out of the situation and solve all your problems. As a result, for a long while, Make Verte was spammed in the chats of a ton of different streamers, whether they were struggling with what to do or interrupted simply because it was the easiest and funniest solution available. 
However, due to Verte's bandit in the TCG and OCG, it's a lot harder to use them to solve all your issues, and now decks have to rely on other plan B options if their main plans are interrupted. But if you're really desperate to solve a problem, Master Duel still has Anaconda legal, allowing you to make Verte whenever you please. Blackwing Shura the Blue Flame has an impressive 1800 attack stat, but is definitely weaker than your Stardust Dragon, until the damage step. Because flying into number 6 is Blackwing Kalut the Moon Shadow, the archetypal honest for Blackwings that became a huge main thanks to Simo and Nim Nim's Yu-Gi-Oh! progression series. This series has actually spawned a ton of different Yu-Gi-Oh! memes, from the Secrets of Eternity copypasta to hating on dual monster staples. And one of the most successful and most played decks of this particular series was Blackwings, which was piloted by Simo so often that, for fans of the Progression series, Blackwings grew into meme status in a number of different ways, and had fans begging for Nim Nim to find a strategy to beat it, or for Simo to play literally anything else. There was just one big problem. Blackwings were just too overpowered in such a limited format, so it was almost impossible for Nim Nim to beat the strategy, and Simo wasn't incentivized to play anything else. Because Blackwings are capable of swarming the field with a ton of bodies, had amazing generic support, and can beat over pretty much any monster in the game thanks to both Sirogo the Dawn and Kalut the Moon Shadow. And in a ton of pivotal moments where Nim Nim was about to win a duel, Simo would build up suspense before uttering the immortal phrase, Damage Step? And surprise Nim Nim with a Kalut from the hand to crush his chances of breaking his losing streak. The great part about this meme is that while it originated from Kalut, it can actually be applied to a ton of different situations involving Damage Step, because the best part about the meme isn't the fact that it's Black Wings, it's the shock that comes from having just the right card you need to beat over an opponent's oppressive boss monster, whether that's the effect of a Kalut, an Honest, or even a Forbidden Droplet to modify attack values. This is especially terrifying for your opponent because the damage step is incredibly restrictive in the types of effects that you're allowed to activate. So, if your opponent cockily lets you attack your weak monster into their expertly noir, thinking they've won the duel, you can smile and evilly recite damage step and drop your attack modifier in Noir won't be able to do anything to stop it, leaving them utterly helpless and distraught as their ultimate towers is being over by a tiny bird. The damage step is a cruel and unforgiving place, and Simo's progression series showed that off quite often, with Simo's words now being ingrained in the minds of duelists everywhere whenever they have an effect that can be activated in the damage step to turn the tide of a duel. Intruding into number 5 is Ojama Country, a field spell belonging to one of the most aesthetically ugly and strange archetypes in the game, the Ojamas. Now, Ojamas have always been a bit of a meme in the Yu-Gi-Oh! community ever since they were first introduced, because in the anime they acted as comic relief as the dual spirits for Chaz Princeton by annoying the Chaz in funny ways. And their playstyle suits that status, as the deck's original playstyle was based around blocking your opponent's monster zones with either zone blockers or tokens, and so some duelists would dedicate themselves to playing wacky or wild Ojama decks and variants either because of the love of the GX anime, or because they wanted to play a funny meme deck that can win duels in a strange and unique way. Or unique until Kashtira came around at least. But the reason why Ojama Country is on this list is specifically because of its artwork. You see, Ojama Country depicts a normal Ojama village with several different iconic Ojama monsters that have been released for the archetype, with Ojama yellow, green, black, blue, and red all getting into some wacky antics. But as well as the currently released Ojamas, Ojama Country implies the existence of several other yet to be released Ojama monsters. There's a lemon Ojama flying in the air, a purple Ojama watching over the others, a gray Ojama posing on top of a hill, and of course a lime Ojama standing in the foreground. And it was this particular Ojama that caught the attention of Rank 10 Yu-Gi-Oh, otherwise known as Rada, who asked Konami the ultimate question of where Ojama Lime was in the Archetype Archive for Ojama, a question that hasn't been formally answered to this day. And so Ojama Lime became a mainstay in Rada's channel, going on wacky adventures and appearing in random videos and skits and memes to try and answer the question of what happened to Ojama Lime. This captured the imagination of Rank 10's audience who eventually spread Ojama Line to a wider community to the point where now Ojama Line is an icon, not just for Radis channel, but for the entire meme community in Yu-Gi-Oh, who uses Ojama Lime as a punchline simply because he looks funny. But even though Konami hasn't come forward with an Ojama Lime card, or directly answered any questions about him, his fate has at least been implied in the artwork of several different cards featuring Ojama. So, what happened to Ojama Lime? He most likely died alongside all of the other unreleased Ojamas featured in Ojama Country. Their skulls are present in the artwork for Solidary, which shows most of the living Ojamas standing in a graveyard of their own people, likely having been hunted to death by the Harpy Ladies. But even though Ojama Lime is no longer with us, he remains in the hearts and minds of Ojama fans across the world, as a quirky mascot for the deck that shows off its annoying but silly nature. And for as long as the deck remains a fan-favorite archetype, 
people are always going to ask the question of where is Ojama Lime until one day it gets released. And boarding into number 4 is Eldlich the Golden Lord, a deck that can build up an impressive board of interactions while sitting behind a ton of floodgates that most decks are going to struggle to deal with, which makes it nearly impossible to break their board. What's that? End of main phase? End of battle phase? Banishing the entire field at number 4 is evenly matched, a trap card which has turned the phrase end of battle phase into a statement to be feared. You see, evenly matched is a trap card that you can only activate at the end of the battle phase, and forces your opponent to banish cards they control face down so they control the same number as you. But the real kicker is that evenly matched can be activated from the hand, making it an insane board breaking tool since you can just move to the battle phase without controlling any cards, activate it immediately from your hand, and then your opponent is forced to wipe away their entire field apart from one card since you technically control evenly. This means a resolved evenly match is game winning, because if your deck can't put up a spell at trap negate or a way to counter evenly before the end of the battle phase, you're left with pretty much nothing while your opponent gets a chance to combo off in main phase too. This became a huge meme because of the way phases work in Yu-Gi-Oh. You see, you have to declare every phase you're going to leave before you actually leave it, just in case your opponent wants to activate a card or effect within that phase, such as Nibiru the Primal Bean, which is main phase only, and so you wouldn't be able to use it if your opponent could switch to the battle phase without warning. And so during the main phase, if your opponent controls no cards and declares end of main phase, there's a really solid chance that they have evenly, leaving you in suspense as they enter the battle phase as you realize that your board might be getting cleared until they utter the phrase, end of battle phase. Just like how Nibiru made the phrase, was that your fifth summon into a horrifying sentence for Yu-Gi-Oh players, evenly matched has made it so end of main phase and end of battle phase are terrifying declarations that can lead you to losing games if you know what's about to happen. So much so that it's actually a fairly common tactic to end your main phase while you control no cards, even while you don't have evenly matched in hand, because some decks like Labyrinth and Runic don't really care about their first battle phase. And so this tactic is used to bait your opponent to dumping resources in order to play around evenly matched, just because they know that if they don't, it's likely they're going to lose the duel. This only adds to the fear that the end of main phases creates, because now you never really know if your opponent has evenly, or whether you're being baited into making a terrible play. As a competitive stable, evenly match is an incredibly strong card that'll be in people's side decks for years to come for how amazing its removal effect is. And as a meme, it's definitely the most frightening one on this list, unless you're terrified of Ojama Lime. And flipping into number 3 is Solemn Judgment, the face of counter traps that you put in your deck whenever you just don't want to deal with your opponent's cards. You see, the thing about Solemn Judgment is that it can negate any spell or trap card activation or negate the special summon of any monster, but you have to pay half your life points in order to do so. This gives Solemn Judgment a wide range of cards that you can just say no to. If your opponent is going to Dark Ruler your board, you can just flip Solemn Judgment and say no. If your opponent is about to synchro some of their boss monster, no they aren't. If they're trying to wipe your field with evenly match, the old man says no. Essentially, the old man saying no is a humorous way of telling your opponent that what they're trying to do isn't going to happen. Because sometimes in Yu-Gi-Oh, cards and effects will happen that you're just going to want to say no to because they're either unfair, overpowered, or sometimes a mix of both. And most cards that depict the old man usually have some kind of effect that allows you to say no to all different kinds of cards. Solemn Judgment can't negate monster effects, but Solemn Strike does so easily. And while Strike can't negate an emergency teleport, Solemn Warning is another way of letting you say no. And because the Solemn cards are so well loved and pop up so much in the competitive metagame, some Yu-Gi-Oh players have even taken to calling the god depicted in the Solemn cards, Solemn Johnson, the old man with infinite power who can say no to everything. Given how so many cards in the modern era have a ton of different effects, it's nice that in some circumstances you can just say no. That you don't need to read their effects or know what happens next because you're simply not going to allow that to happen. And it's all thanks to the insane power of Solemn Johnson. And drawn in number two is Monster Cardo. Drawn into number two is Monster Cardo. Drawn in number two, it's actually just spell card Berserker Soul. This card managed to reach meme status due to how it was used in the Dual Monsters anime. Because in the anime, Berserker Soul lets you, if you attack with a monster with 1500 less attack, draw a card. And if it was a monster, that monster with 1500 less attack could then make another attack. Then, after that monster was attacked again, you could draw another card, and if it was another monster, your monster could make another attack. And this repeated over and over until you draw a non-monster card. This effect was used in order to deliver one of the most brutal beatdowns in anime history by Yama Yugi against Weevil Underwood during the Seal of Horror Calcos arc in the anime, where Yama Yugi won the duel after reducing Weevil's life points down to zero, after attacking multiple times with Berserker Soul. But then, Yami gave into his rage, and even after Weevil's life points had been reduced to zero, Yami kept drawing cards, unleashing attack after attack on Weevil, uncaring for his well-being, 
and was only stopped after Teya begged the pharaoh to let Weevil go. The English dub did an okay job of showing off his rage, but in the original Japanese version, which captured people's hearts, because instead of the quips that Yami did in the English dub, Yami was so embraced by his anger that he could only say two words. Monster Cardo. Now, unfortunately, despite how well-loved Berserker Soul is in the community, it doesn't really see any competitive play. Part of that is because of how its effect was changed in the TCG to only inflict 500 damage instead of allowing you to attack multiple times. But the main reason it doesn't see much use is just because it's a somewhat situational OTK tool that's not as reliable as something like Axis Kotaka or Boral Sword Dragon. But even though Berserker Soul doesn't see any competitive play, Draw Monster Cardo is still an omnipresent phrase in the community, and is something you might hear whenever your opponent draws for turn, for a fact, or potentially if they're about to go overkill and OTK your opponent with a ton of attack points. In fact, Weevil's beatdown is so well known that even more casual players and people who don't play Yu-Gi-Oh! are aware of it, simply because it's such a famous beatdown that was an astonishingly cool moment for any kid to watch. Berserker Soul might not see any play in the actual card game, but what it represents is still very much present in the modern game. You can still easily lose yourself in the power of your own cards and launch an insane OTK with your deck to knock your opponent's life points down to zero several times over. And activating into number one as the most iconic meme on this list is Mirror Force, Magic Cylinder, and pretty much every other trap card in the game because every one of them lets you say the magical phrase, you just activated my trap card. Trap cards have been an important part of Yu-Gi-Oh's identity going so far back as a Legend of Blue Eyes White Dragon that helped differentiate it from the biggest competitor at the time, Magic the Gathering. And they've always been a neat feature of the game, allowing you to prepare a set trap card for your opponent to step into, letting you feel like you're in complete control of the duel as they panic over what your set card could do. And in early Yu-Gi-Oh, trap cards saw common play since they were some of the only ways you could interact with your opponent during their turn, and had some generically busted effects that warped the format at the time, which made cards like Mirror Force, Magic Cylinder, and Torrential Tribute staples not just in playground strategies, but even in competitive meta decks for the ability to turn the tide of a duel in your favor. And that's exactly why, in the anime, trap cards were often so used in order to create suspense and drama, and just what a duelist set card could be, and how it could end up swinging the duel in their favor. Trap cards made the anime exciting, interesting, and showed duelists that no matter the situation, you could pull back a duel with a well-timed trap. And all of that suspense often culminated as soon as you heard the phrase, you just activated my trap card. This immortal phrase is one a ton of people remember due to how often it and warnings like it were repeated in the anime because of how pivotal and exciting these moments were. This led to the phrase becoming popular in both Yu-Gi-Oh! and non-Yu-Gi-Oh! meme circles alike, because it related to people's childhood memories of watching the anime and seeing Yu-Gi-Oh! Kaiba win duels thanks to a well-placed trap card, to the point where even the most casual fan of the game is going to understand the reference due to how widespread the meme is. What's even better is that trap cards are still a core part of the game even to this day. Because even though most decks rely on monsters and spell cards to make their plays, there are still a ton of trap cards that have stable status, that allow you to use this iconic phrase. And for as long as there is a playable trap card in Yu-Gi-Oh, people are going to reference the meme. In fact, even terrible trap cards that aren't fit for the modern meta will still find a way into people's decks just because they think it's cool to activate a mirror force in order to mirror their favorite characters, or just because they're some of their favorite cards from their childhood. Other than Exodia and Pot of Greed, You Just Activated My Trap Card is probably the most widespread Yu-Gi-Oh meme out there, and it's one that encapsulates people's love towards the game, the anime, and the surprise twists that come with both. It's an iconic phrase that's fun to say, and one that casual and competitive players alike share a shared love of. In this video, we'll be having the first ever double top 10. In the first half of the video, we'll go over the top 10 most represented monster types. And in the second half, we'll go over the 10 least represented monster types. Now let's get started. First up at number 10 for the most represented monster types, we've got zombies. Clocking in at 206 monsters in their archetype. I should mention these numbers are not exact, despite the fact that I'm giving a very specific number, but they're pretty close. Zombie monsters are the 10th most plentiful monster type in the game and have some of the best graveyard support in the vein of Mezuki, which when combined with Zombie World allows you to special summon any monster from the graveyard, using a resource from the graveyard, which is really good. And at number 9 we have insect type monsters, clocking in at 213 monsters listed as insect type. Insects don't have anywhere near as good of generic support like Mezuki, but does have tons of floaters. Insects might have the most amount of floaters out of any other archetypes. So if you're an insect type monster with less than 1500 attack or defense, 
there's a good chance there's like five different insects that can bring you straight out from the deck. And at number eight, we have the Winged Beasts, clocking in at 269 monsters. Winged Beasts have one of the archetypes with the most amount of monsters, and that is Black Wings. Black Wings randomly get new support all the time, and it's kind of a joke in the Yu-Gi-Oh community for every new set to come out with some kind of Black Wing support. And Winged Beasts also encompass the Harpy archetype and have access to Icarus Attack, which used to be a big deal back in the day when people still play traps. And at number 7, we have the Beast type, just normal beast, clocking in at 309 cards of the type. And I'm not really sure why. Like, sure, there have been some beast archetypes, there's lots of generic beast support, but for some reason there's just a lot of beast type monsters, even if a lot of them are level 2 or lower. These monsters do also have access to Ares Rock Sunrise, which is a monster reborn specifically for beasts only, which is really good generic support for them. And at number 6, we have Fairies, clocking in at 401 monsters of their type. Now, Fairies make kind of more sense than Beasts, for having so many cards, because usually if Konami releases any kind of Angel-like card, they call it Fairy-type and angel-like creatures are very prevalent in fantasy, so it's easy to see why there's so many of them. And at number 5, we have the complete opposite of fairies, and that's the fiend type, clocking in at 640 monsters. Over 200 more monsters than fairies. In fact, there are more fiend-type monsters than fairy-type monsters than there are zombie-type monsters in the game. To give you an idea of how many fiends there are, which, just like fairies, makes perfect sense. Fiends is basically what they call monsters, which are supposed to look like devils and demons, which is incredibly common in fantasy-like media, and usually shows up much more often in varied than angels do. There's just more different and unique ways to draw demons than there are fairies. And there have been many good archetypes completely dominated by fiend-type monsters in the past, and fiends are swamped with a plethora of support, and even then, they're only the fifth most numerous. And at number four, we have the dragon type, clocking in at 551 monsters. Honestly, I thought dragons would be a little bit higher on this list, considering just how many people love dragons, but then I remembered just how few dragons there were in the first set of Yu-Gi-Oh! because of how badly I wanted to play a dragon-only deck back then, and I just couldn't find enough cards to fill it out. Of course, nowadays there's lots more dragons than there used to be, and dragons are a very popular card for extra deck monsters, and Dragon Rulers is probably some of the best support for a monster type ever released. That's currently banned. But even then, dragons have other tons of support, where making a card dragon type honestly gives it a little bit of an edge over other cards, because of stuff like Dragon's Ravine, Return of the Dragon Lords, and Red Eyes Darkness Metal Dragon. And at number three, we have Spellcasters, clocking in at 578 monsters. Seeing as the main character of the first Yu-Gi-Oh! anime had a spellcaster as his main boss monster, spellcasters being this high on the list is kind of a no-brainer, and there's so much support for spellcasters that, just like dragons, being a spellcaster is kind of a bonus. Kind of. They don't have a good generic searcher, and a lot of the support requires you to make decks around it, or only supports very specific types of spellcasters, like dark spellcasters or wind spellcasters, etc. So honestly, it might be a little bit better to be dragon type, despite how much spellcasters there are and how much support there is for them. And at number two, we have machines, clocking in at 767 monsters. There are a surprising amount of machines and a surprising lack of generic machine support, which kind of baffles the mind when you see just how many machine type monsters there are. But the main reason there's so many machine type monsters is because if they wanted to make a race of monsters that looked even a little bit metallic, they would just make them machine type, before psychic and cyber type monsters were added to the game anyway. Although, despite the massive amount of machine type monsters in the game, being a machine type is honestly kind of a detriment, because there is really good machine counter cards in the game, like some of the cyber dragon fusions and the spell card system down. One of the few cases where the archetype having so many cards kind of works against it. And at number one, we have the warrior type, clocking in at 891 monsters. Warrior type monsters have more monsters in their archetype 
than the bottom 9 least represented monster types in the game combined. There are so many warrior type monsters, because whenever Konami wants to make a new race for an archetype that look vaguely like humans, they get slapped with the warrior tag. Warrior type is basically human type, and there's lots of humans. And being the most plentiful type of monster in the game, there's also a lot of support for warriors, to the point where the generic searcher for warrior types, reinforcements of the army, is limited on the ban list, whereas better search cards, like Fossil Dig, are unlimited with no such restrictions. And that's because there's so many more targets for reinforcements than there are for Fossil Dig. And really, since humans are one of the most prevalent things in fantasy media, or just media in general, it's no wonder they're the number one spot. On the most represented list, anyway. Alright, now let's go over the top 10 least represented monster types now. And at number 10 on this second list, we have the Reptile type, clocking in at 141 cards, about 60 cards less than the number 10 spot on the most plentiful list. Now, despite having a low representative count of monsters, reptiles actually have pretty good support. It's just they don't really have any good reptile-type monsters to use that support with. So, if sometime in the future they release a good reptile-specific archetype, you might see some cards like Snake Rain being put on the ban list. And at number 9, we have the Psychic Type, clocking in at 131 monsters. Psychic Type was the first new monster type they added to the game, being added to the game alongside Synchro Monsters. And being one of the newer monster types, they don't really have that many cards in their archetype. Although, surprisingly, there are currently more Cybers type monsters in the game than there are Psychic Type despite the fact that Cybers monsters were the most recent added monster type to the game. And that's mainly because a vast majority of Link monsters are Cybers type, which kind of gives them a little advantage. Now, despite Psychic type's low representation, they have great support for their archetype, and even have one of their generic support cards, Emergency Teleport, limited on the ban list for being too good at supporting Psychic types. And at number 8, we have the Pyro type clocking in at 116 monsters. There are very few pyrotype monsters, and even fewer archetypes based around pyrotype. And the only saving grace they have is that sometimes, whenever they release a fiery type of monster, they'll make them pyrotype. Honestly, since there's a fire attribute in this game, most of the time when they release a fiery archetype, they have nothing to do with pyrotype monsters, and instead just have the fire attribute, as well as some other creature tag. Despite that though, pyrotypes do have good support, and when volcanics were meta for a hot second, people saw just how good some of the sleeper hits for pyrotype monsters actually were. And at number 7, we have Thunder Type, clocking in at 111 monsters. Honestly, before Thunder Dragons came out, Thunder Type had to be one of the least useful types of monsters to be part of, and their only generic support were the Hunter monsters basically which just gave you extra normal summons for only level 4 light thunder type monsters specifically. But with thunder dragons having lots of support that's generic to thunder types in general, thunder is actually a really good tag to have, to the point where being thunder type gives it an advantage now, where before thunder dragons, it would have been a detriment. And at number 6, we have the dinosaur type, clocking in at 105 monsters. Now, this one surprised me at being so low. I had no idea there were so few dinosaur-type monsters, considering how prevalent dinosaur-type monster decks have been in the past, especially with how good Dino Rabbit was and how good dinosaurs are right now, because of the plethora of good dinosaur-specific support, and the fact they also have a good dinosaur-specific searcher that's even better than reinforcements of the army. But there's just not very many dinosaur-type monsters in total, and considering how popular dinosaurs are in fantasy media, I thought there would have been way more. And at number 5, we have the fish type, clocking in at 101 monsters. This one doesn't surprise me at all. In fact, I thought this would probably be the least represented type on this list, not middle of the pack. Now, despite having a small monster count, fish type have actually very good support, and falls into the camp of being fish type is an advantage. And in fact, there are so few fish types that a lot of the support that works on fish also works on aqua and sea serpent type monsters, since they're all kind of watery anyway. And at number 4, we have the sea serpent type, 
clocking in at only 66 cards in the monster type. Another one which entirely makes sense. I can barely even think of 5 sea serpent type monsters off the top of my head. Now, despite the very small amount of sea serpent type monsters, they fall into the camp of having good support. Mainly because a lot of its support works on three types of monsters. Aqua, fish, and sea serpent. But also because sea serpents have the Atlanteans, who are the ultimate water type support monsters. And Deep Sea Diva, who's such a good sea serpent support card that it's currently limited on the ban list. Now, the main reason there's so few sea serpents is because they generally use sea serpent types for big boss monsters only. And at number three, we have the worm type, clocking in at 63 monsters. Worms were the second new monster type added to the game, and are supposed to be like a mythical dragon or something. Basically, if they want to release a new dragon type monster, but don't want to give it the advantage of having the dragon type, they just make it worm type instead to balance it out. Which is why I think they added this monster type to the game, as otherwise it doesn't really make any sense. And since there are so few worm types, basically all of the archetypes that are worm types specifically is generally generic and works on all other worms, making it actually a pretty good monster type to be part of, but not as good as dragons. And at number two, we have the Divine Beast type, clocking in at only five monsters with this monster tag. This monster tag was created purely for lore reasons and wasn't really needed. You see, in the anime, all the god cards were divine type, which made them better than normal monsters, but in the real game, the god cards are basically just regular monsters that are hard to bring out. Their typing is more of a flavorful thing, and since only one archetype in the game has this monster tag, nearly all of the god cards' support cards specifically mention either the divine attribute or the divine beast type, as it's just easier than trying to mention the god cards by name. And at number one, the least represented monster type in the game, and that is the creator god monster type clocking in at only one monster having this car type, which is Hothraki, the creator of light, which is a monster with an instant win effect that activates if you summon it, and in order to summon this card, you must tribute the three god cards on your side of the field. So it's kind of hard to bring out, and I don't think it was ever actually released in the TCG. Not that it matters, because it's not very good anyway, and this one entirely has its own type for lore reasons as well. Basically, it's a flavorful thing, there's no real reason for it to have its own specific type, other than that it looks cool. Many times over the history of Yu-Gi-Oh, a new card or archetype will be added to the game that makes an old card completely broken retroactively. In this list, I'll be going over 10 cards which have the potential to be broken if they get really good support cards or archetypes in the future. And at number 10, we have Rekindling. Rekindling is a spell card with the effect that allows you to special summon as many fire monsters from your graveyard with 200 defense exactly as possible, but then they're banished during the end phase. So if you have five fire monsters with exactly 200 defense each, you can just bring them all out with this card, which is not a hard once per turn. It's basically like soul charge without any of the downsides, and that's because it only works on a very specific type of monster, fire type monsters with exactly 200 defense which was actually a lot of them, to be honest. Usually when fire monsters are released, they're generally given 200 defense because of how much support there is for fire monsters with 200 defense. And that's why Rekindling is currently limited. Whenever a questionable card would be put on the ban list back in the day, players would usually ask why that card was put on the ban list when Rekindling was still at 3. Rekindling used to be the go-to card to contrast cards that people thought were unfairly put on the ban list, because if a card like Rekindling, which is obviously really strong, was still at 3 copies, then why was this other, weaker card being banned? The answer to that was because no one was really using Rekindling in any kind of successful meta deck, and honestly, I think that's the only reason it's limited, is because of how much people complained about it when compared to other banned cards. And no one was really surprised when it was limited, because the card was just that strong. But it's not banned. And that's why it's only at number 10 on this list, because it's already restricted in some way. And it's also a very good indication of what kind of cards we'll be talking about in this video. And at number 9, we have Mysterious Triangle. Mysterious Triangle is a quick play spell card, part of the alien archetype, which has the effect to destroy one monster on the field with an A counter. 
Then you could special summon any level 4 alien monster from your deck, but it's destroyed during the end phase. So if one of your opponent's cards has an A counter on them, you can destroy that card and then special summon any level 4 alien monster from your deck, both of which are good effects. It's essentially a plus 1 in card economy, as you get rid of one of your opponent's monsters and get to special summon a monster from your deck, which I might add is one of the best effects that a card can do. It is very rare that a card allows you to special summon something from the deck, and if they do, they usually have heavy limitations to them or restrictions. Now, the reason Mysterious Triangle doesn't see play is because alien decks are kind of a joke. Aliens generally revolve around using A counters on the field, and any deck that uses counters on your opponent's cards has an inherent disadvantage, because cards don't usually stay in the field long enough to keep those counters on them. So if you could just activate Mysterious Triangle to destroy one of your opponent's monsters, and then special summon an alien without requiring any A counters, this card would be insanely good. But since it requires an A counter, it doesn't really see play. If this card were to ever see play in a competitive environment, they would need to release a new set of aliens that had actual good effects, and that could easily distribute A counters on the field. Number 8, UA Power Jersey. This will be the only equipped card on this list, and its effect is it can only be equipped to a UA monster. That monster gains 1000 attack and defense, which, okay, that's neat. An attack booster equipped card isn't the best thing in the world, but it's its next effect that makes this card potentially broken. If the UA monster battles an opponent's monster, your opponent takes double battle damage, and it can make a second attack in a row. Double battle damage is good. Being able to inflict double battle damage two times is even better, and could potentially just straight up win you the game on its own. Say for example, you equip Power Jersey to a UA monster with 2500 attack. They would have 3500 attack, and if they attacked over two of your opponent's monsters with 1500 attack, that's 8000 points of battle damage. It is very easy to OTK your opponent with this card, especially since UAs have lots of ways to increase their attack powers even further. Now, the reason this card doesn't see play is because UAs aren't very good, as they have lots of consistency issues, not helped by the fact that they only have one level 4 lower monster. A majority of UA monsters are over level 5, and generally, equipped cards don't see play unless they special summon something from the graveyard or further combo plays. Rarely are they used for actual attack damage, but UA Power Jersey is so good that I could totally see it maybe being broken in the future if they release some more good UA monsters to equip it to. Number 7, Feast of the Wild Level 5. This card has the effect to special summon two level 5 warrior type monsters from your hand and or graveyard, but their effects are negated for the rest of the turn and they cannot attack. So if you have two level 5 warrior type monsters in your graveyard, it's basically a monster reborn for two cards, and their effects are only negated for one turn, so you can use their effects on your next turn if you want to but usually they're best used for combo plays immediately. This card has the potential to be really good, but currently there aren't really any good level 5 warrior type monsters to use this card with. So while it's a good combo extender, it doesn't really see play for basically not having too many good targets for it. So if there were ever to be a good archetype release in the future that revolved around level 5 warrior type monsters specifically, you can bet this card would see tons of play. And at number 6, we have Emergeroid Call. This is a counter trap card that can only be activated when a spell trap or monster effect is activated while you control a Roid Fusion monster. You can negate that effect and then send all the cards of the same name as that card from that player's deck and extra deck to the graveyard. Not only that, it also has a graveyard effect where you can banish this card from your graveyard to add a Roid monster from your graveyard to your hand. Basically, it just allows you to go plus 1 off of its graveyard effect. Both of those effects are good. Being able to negate one of anything and then send all copies of that card to the graveyard is a really good counter trap card effect. And its graveyard effect is a really good graveyard effect. This trap card is a whole package. The only problem being is it belongs to the Roid archetype. And that you have to have a Roid fusion monster to actually activate its negate. But really, it's it belonging to the Roid archetype that's the biggest problem. Roids are kind of a joke archetype for being bad, and they did release a new wave of support with speed roids, 
but there are no fusion speed roids, so there's no real reason to play this card with them. And they did release a new wave of support for roids. This is where this card comes from. As even with how good this card is, the roid monsters are just not very good. And they need to release either some speed roid fusion monsters, or just better roid monsters to make this card be playable. Or even potentially broken. Number 5. Try White. Try White has the effect to special summon three monsters from your graveyard without any other kinds of summoning restrictions for the turn, like with Soul Charge, nor even a once per turn clause. The reason this card doesn't see play is because it only works on level 2 or lower normal monsters. Being able to special summon three monsters from the graveyard at once is a really good effect, bordering on broken, but the fact that they're normal monsters severely restricts how useful this card actually is. Because playing normal monsters in your deck is something you almost never want to do, because normal monsters are essentially dead cards in your hand, no matter how useful their stats or levels might be. Normal monsters can't do anything on their own, and they need support cards to do everything for them. So usually, they make those kinds of support cards really good, like Tri White allowing you to special summon three of them from the graveyard. But there are some effect monsters that treat themselves as normal monsters while in the hand or graveyard, sort of like Gemini monsters or Dragon Spirit of White. So if they were to ever release a series of really good level 2 or lower monsters with effects similar to Dragon Spirit of White, then Tri White could potentially be really good. Number 4, Photon Alexandra Queen. This is a rank 4 monster that has the effect where you can detach 1 Exceeds material to return all monsters on the field to the hand, then inflict 300 damage to each player for every card returned to the hand. It's essentially a non-destruction, non-targeting board wipe, as it just bounces all of the monster cards on the field back to the hand, which is one of the best ways to get rid of your opponent's monsters, as there's so many cards nowadays that both can't be targeted by effects and have some kind of protection from being destroyed. It even has decent stats on it, even if it does get returned to the extra deck as well with its own effect. Now, the reason this card doesn't see play is because of its summoning requirements. It requires two level 4 Butter Spy monsters, and there are only three Butter Spy monsters in the game. And only one of them has any kind of swarming effect, where it can special summon itself from your hand if you normal summon a warrior type monster. So their Exceeds monster has a really good effect, it's just there is not enough of the monsters from its archetype, and the ones that do exist aren't very good. So, if they were to ever release a new wave of support for this card, like really good cards, I could totally see this card being held as a big problem. I also don't see something like that happening anytime soon. It's more likely that a new wave of support will be released that allows cards to easily rank up into this card. Kind of like how Azathoth started seeing play when people were able to rank it up during their opponent's turn, despite no one really using the card before then. Number 3, Tachyon Transmigration. This is a counter trap card that can be activated at the end of a chain of cards, if you control a Galaxy Eyes monster, and then it will negate all of the cards in that chain and shuffle them back into the deck. And if you control specifically a card with Galaxy Eyes Tachyon Dragon in its name, you can activate this card from your hand. Being able to negate all of the cards in a chain is really good, especially since it also just works on one card. You don't have to resolve it at the end of a long chain of cards. Sending all of those negated cards back to the deck is better than destroying them and sending them to the graveyard because most decks use cards from the graveyard as a resource. And having the option to activate this card from your hand is really good. Most of the trap cards that do see play in the current meta see play because they can be activated from the hand. All of its effects are really great, so if this card was part of a good archetype, it would probably have been banned already. And therein lies the problem of why no one uses it. It can only be used in a Galaxy Eyes deck. And Galaxy Eyes decks are generally not the best things in the world. At least not on the meta level. And at number 2, we have Machine Duplication. This card has the effect where you can special summon two more copies of a machine type monster you control with 500 or less attack. Now, like I mentioned with the Mysterious Triangle card, special summoning monsters from your deck is an incredibly good and very rare effect for cards to have. So a card like Machine Duplication, which can bring out two copies, has the potential to be really good and in fact, it has already been abused in the past. There are currently two cards limited on the ban list, basically because of machine duplication. Whenever a machine-type monster is released, 
If it has less than 500 attack, it has the potential to be broken because of machine duplication existing. Bringing out two cards from the deck is just an incredibly strong effect. And I'm kind of surprised this card isn't already on the ban list in some way, shape, or form. And at number one, we have Snake Rain. This is the card which I think has the highest potential to be broken, but currently it sees absolutely no play. That's because there aren't any good reptile-type monsters to use it with. Snake Rain has the effect where you can discard one card to send four specific reptile-type monsters from your deck to the graveyard. It's like a Foolish Burial on steroids, except only for reptile-type monsters. And Foolish Burial is a card that's so good that it's limited to one. The only other card in the game that exists that allows you to send four specific cards to the graveyard is the banned spell card called Painful Choice, a card commonly held as one of the most broken cards ever made. Except that card also allows you to add one card to your hand, and doesn't require you to discard as a cost. Snake Rain is a much more watered down version of Painful Choice, but it does allow you to selectively mill four cards from your deck, which is potentially a really good effect. Now, the only problem with this card, as I said earlier, there are no good reptile type archetypes. Pretty much every good reptile type monster is either one off in an archetype, or of the few reptile archetypes that do exist, they're all basically gimmicks. Reptiles are one of the least represented types of monsters in the game, and that's why Snake Rain has existed for as long as it has without any problems. It is like the poster boy of a card which has the potential to be incredibly broken, but currently there aren't enough good reptile type monsters with graveyard effects that exist in the game, yet. And that's why I think it's a perfect spot for the number one on this list. Now, power crept is a term for when a more powerful version of a card is released, meaning there's no reason to play the original card anymore. But in this list, we'll be going over cards which have been power crept, but still continue to see play nonetheless. And at number 10, we have Jinzo, who has basically seen competitive play ever since it first came out in 2002. Jinzo has the effect that while it's on the field, trap cards and their effects cannot be activated, and it negates the effects of all traps. It's a 2400 attack monster that requires one tribute, which gave it a pretty competitive attack power value in the early days of the game, while also basically shutting down one third of all available cards. And locking down trap cards on a one tribute summon has just been situationally useful over the years, even after Summon Skull Beatdown was no longer a meta strategy. But then in 2014, Denko Seka came out, which is a level 4 monster that has the effect where it cannot be special summoned, and also while you control no set spell or trap cards, neither player can set spell or trap cards or activate any spell or trap cards that are already set on the field. And since almost all trap cards need to be set before they're able to be played, Denko Seka is basically a level 4 version of Jinzo, and is much easier to play since you don't need to tribute summon for it, and it still allows you to play spells or continue to use the effects of face-up traps, as its only conditions for its effects are to not have any set cards. But face-up cards are fine, and ever since Denko Seka came out, there wasn't really a reason to play Jinzo, as it's just a better version, if all you want to do is lock down your opponent's trap cards. Of course, you could also just use Royal Decree, which is a trap card that negates other trap cards, just like Jinzo. However, despite the fact that Denko Seka came out in 2014, that surprisingly did not stop Jinzo from seeing play. In fact, in 2017, it saw a huge resurgence in play for some reason, and appeared in about 100 different meta decks during that year that topped events. And that was three years after Denko Seka came out. It was in such a wide variety of decks too that I'm not 100% sure why Jinzo saw such a resurgence in 2017, but it kept seeing play even up to this day, and its last appearance being in a Domain Monarch deck in 2020. Mainly because Domain Monarchs require a Tribute Summon monster to be on the field in order to be able to activate their field spell card, which locks your opponent out of so many monsters from the extra deck, which is not something that's possible if you use Denko Seka instead. Although since 2017, Jinzo has sharply dropped off in competitive play, and I can only imagine that's because Red Reboot came out in 2018. Although despite having so many better versions of itself out there, Jinzo just keeps seeing play nonetheless. And at number 9, we have Mirror Force. This is a trap card that can only be activated when your opponent declares an attack, which then allows you to destroy all of your opponent's attack position monsters. This card came out in 2002, and was a beast of a trap card back in the day, and was even banned for a couple of years. And Mirror Force was so iconic that they just released straight up better versions of it starting in 2015, as Stormy Mirror Force and Blazing Mirror Force came out in that year, 
with Drowning Mirror Force coming out in 2016. All of them have basically the same activation requirements as Mirror Force, where you can only activate them when your opponent declares an attack, and they also get rid of all of your opponent's monsters in a different way. Stormy Mirror Force allows you to bounce all of your opponent's attack position monsters, which is just a better form of removal than destroying them. Blazing Mirror Force allows you to destroy all the cards, just like Mirror Force, and then inflict a whole bunch of effect damage to your opponent and yourself. Drowning Mirror Force allows you to spin all the cards back to the deck, but can only be activated when your opponent declares a direct attack instead of just any old attack. So, these three cards are a lot better. Even Quaking Mirror Force was better for a hot second before Link Monsters came out. So, with so many better versions of Mirror Force, it's kind of surprising that the original one still sees play. They did release a new support card called Mirror Force Launcher that only works with the original Mirror Force and allows you to search it out easier. But that card is not the reason Mirror Force still sees play. In fact, Mirror Force Launcher doesn't see competitive play at all. Funny enough, the reason the original Mirror Force still sees play is because sometimes you just want to destroy your opponent's cards without taking any burn damage. Usually, Stormy Mirror Force is the go-to Mirror Force of choice. But also, the same kind of decks that even play Mirror Force also really love to play cards like Solemn Judgment and Solemn Strike, which require you to pay a whole bunch of life points in order to use their negates. So it's kind of risky to play those good counter trap cards alongside Blazing Mirror Force. And if all they wanted to do was destroy cards and not bounce them, then the original Mirror Force is kind of the best bet. Now, it doesn't see a whole bunch of competitive play. That's why it's at the bottom of this list right next to Jinzo. But it does still see competitive play, even though there's a whole bunch of other better versions of it out there. And at number 8, we have Barrier Statue of the Torrent. This is a pretty low-statted monster with only a 1,000 attack and defense, and simply has the effect that neither player can special summon monsters except water monsters while this card is on the field. This card came out in 2006 alongside a Barrier Statue of all the other attributes. And of all the Barrier Statues, Barrier Statue of the Stormwinds has seen the most amount of competitive play over the years, but Barrier Statue of the Torrent has seen the most meta-competitive play recently. And the barrier statues were powercrafted by a card known as Fossil Dina Pachycephalo, which came out two years later in 2008. Has a slightly higher stats than all the barrier statues, has the effect that if it's flipped face up, you can destroy all special summon monsters on the field, and also, while it's on the field, neither player can special summon any monsters. Usually, if someone wanted to play a card that locks out all special summons and doesn't require a tribute, Fossil Dina Pachycephalo is the go-to choice, as it's the best card that does that. Although occasionally, there are situations in which you'd want to use one of the lesser-powered versions, like Jaojin the Spiritualist, or one of the other barrier statues, which are the only other level 4 lore monsters that prevent special summons and can also be special summoned themselves. And the reason Barrier Statue of the Torrent still sees play is because, for one, it combos pretty well with Paleozoic Frog decks, since they do nothing but special summon water monsters anyway, so they can play this Floodgate pretty easily, and also, surprisingly, because it has a nice combo in dinosaur decks. There's a card called Gizmek Uka, the Festive Fox of Fucinity, which is a hand trap that has the effect where it can special summon itself from your hand if your opponent special summons a monster from their main deck, and also has the effect that when this card is summoned, you can target one monster your opponent controls in order to special summon one monster from your deck, who both shares the attribute of that monster your opponent controls, and has an attack that equals its own defense. Now usually, this is used in order to search out a copy of Animadorned Archosaur, who has zero attack and defense and allows you to search out more dinosaurs. But if you use this card during your opponent's turn when they activate the effect of Crystron Halky Fibrax, then you can target Crystron Halky Fibrax in order to special summon a water monster from your deck. And what do you know? Barrier Statue of the Torrent has an attack that equals its defense. So, with this combo, you can bring out Barrier Statue of the Torrent right at the start of your opponent's combo chain, in order to lock them out of special summoning other monsters except water. And most decks that use Crystron Halky Fibrax in order to go into combos don't use any other water monsters besides Halky Fibrax. So, it's a very ingenious way to bring out a Floodgate during your opponent's turn once their combos start. And once you start your turn, you can simply get rid of Barrier Statue of the Torrent with an Airy the Water Charm or Gentle, and then continue your plays like normal. And at number 7, we have Mystical Space Typhoon. This is a quick play spell card which simply has the effect to destroy one spell or trap card on the field, and was released back in 2002. Mystical Space Typhoon is probably one of the most played cards in the history of the game, 
because it immediately started seeing play once it was released and never stopped seeing play since 2002. Because the ability to destroy a spell or trap card on a quick play spell card is just super valuable, especially since it was the only card that didn't have a cost to do that back in the day. In fact, the card was limited for most of its life on the ban list, and they even released weaker versions of the card because it was so strong. That way, players had some more options to it. Eventually, the power creep of the game got to the point where it wasn't that big of a deal anymore, so they went in the opposite direction and started releasing more powerful versions of Mystical Space Typhoon. In 2016, we got two of the strongest versions of them, Cosmic Cyclone and Twin Twisters. Both of them sharing the distinction of being a quick play spell card, allowing you to either pay a thousand life points to banish a card instead of destroying it, or Twin Twisters, which allows you to discard a card in order to destroy two spell or trap cards instead of one. Both of these effects are just straight up better versions than Mystical Space Typhoon, and to have all the same advantages of being a quick play spell card. And the final nail in the coffin was in 2020 when they released Lightning Storm. However, despite the fact that more powerful versions of this card have been added, Mystical Space Typhoon still sees competitive play, but usually as a side deck option, and also played alongside Cosmic Cyclone and Twin Twisters. Generally, MST is not played by itself. If it sees competitive play, it's because the deck that's using it wants more spell or trap card removal than just Cosmic Cyclone or Twin Twisters. So unlike Barrier Statue of the Torrents, it's not played in place of the card that power crept it, but usually played alongside them. And at number 6, we have Torrential Tribute. This is a trap card that can only be activated when a monster is summoned, and then has the effect to destroy all monsters on the field. Just like Mirror Force, this card was heavily played ever since it first came out, as this one card came out in 2003 and was limited on the ban list for most of its life. Although eventually, the game got to a point where it wasn't that big of a deal anymore, so it was unlimited, set to three copies, and then just kind of never stopped seeing play. Now, Torrential Tribute doesn't really have one card that directly improves upon it like the previous four spots, but they did release a board wipe trap card in the game that's so powerful that there's no reason to play Torrential Tribute if you just want to get rid of all the cards on the field. There's a trap card called Evenly Match, which you can only play at the end of the battle phase in order to force your opponent to banish cards from their side of the field face down, so that they control the same number of cards as you do. And if you control no cards, you can activate this card from your hand, which basically forces your opponent to banish all but one card they control. And with how much less play trap cards have seen over the years, if someone was playing any trap card at all, it would probably be something like Evenly Matched and not Torrential Tribute. So it's not a direct power creep. It's more of a showcase that there's better board wipe trap cards in the game now, as Evenly Matched works on spells and traps in addition to monsters. However, Torrential Tribute received new support in 2020, called Fury of the Chiron Shin, which allows you to search out Torrential Tribute from your deck, and then has a graveyard effect that allows you to protect water monsters from destruction effects. And funny enough, this card is not why Torrential Tribute continues to see play. In fact, most decks that still play Torrential Tribute don't play the Searcher at all. It generally just sees play in trap-heavy decks, like Paleozoic Frogs, which can actually make use of the Searcher, but also decks like Eldlich and Altergeist, who don't play any water monsters, but do use a lot of trap cards. Being able to destroy all monsters in your opponent's turn is pretty valuable, and generally, being able to wipe out all monsters in the field has historically been pretty strong. And decks that play a whole bunch of trap cards can't really play evenly matched to its full potential, even if they'll sometimes play it alongside Torrential Tribute anyway. Because evenly matched is still just a really good card to play if you're going second, even if you do have a bunch of other trap cards in your deck. And at number 5, we have Lava Golem. This card has the effect where it can only be special summoned from your hand to your opponent's side of the field by tributing two other monsters. Then, locks you out of being able to normal summon for the turn, and inflicts 1,000 points of burn damage to your opponent during each of their standby phases. And Lava Golem's an excellent card for getting rid of normally indestructible monsters, as very few cards have protection from being tributed. Lava Golem was released in 2003, and saw pretty niche play over the years. But then in 2015, the entire Kaiju archetype was released, and also the Winged Dragon of Raw Sphere mode. The Kaijus are an archetype of monsters that allow you to tribute one of your opponent's monsters in order to special summon them from your hand to your opponent's side of the field. And one of the great distinctions about Kaijus is they don't lock you out of your normal summon when you use it. So they provide an excellent form of removal without a huge trade-off, other than the fact that you're giving your opponent a high attack monster. And the Winged Dragon of Raw Sphere mode basically has the same conditions as Lava Golem, where you need to give up your normal summon in order to use it, but it allows you to tribute three monsters instead of two so it's just straight up better version of Lava Golem for the effect of getting rid of cards. So with the entire Kaiju archetype in Winged Dragon and Raw Sphere mode, 
there was not really a reason to use Lava Golem anymore, since it's kind of a worse version of both of those things. Except, it keeps seeing play anyway, which is kind of the theme for this list. And the reason Lava Golem keeps seeing play is a threefold reason. For one, it sees play a lot in Infernoid decks as a side deck option, as that deck is all about having cards in the main deck who can't be normal summoned or set. And they don't really normal summon anyway, so they're perfectly fine playing Lava Golem as is able to fit well inside that deck. And outside of Infernoid decks, it usually sees play alongside the Winged Dragon of Raw Sphere mode, as a side deck option when they just really want to draw a card that can tribute their opponent's monsters. And lastly, it's played instead of Sphere mode in cases when they think their opponent is playing around a Sphere mode, and only ending on two monsters instead of three. Which doesn't matter if you're able to throw a Lava Golem down. Although even in those situations, they usually played alongside Sphere mode. Generally, Lava Golem is just played when they really want to have more Sphere modes, but can't run more since you can only have three copies per deck. Lava Golem is just the next best thing, and generally only played in decks that don't really use their normal summon very much, like Infernoids or Pendulum decks. And at number 4, we have Skullmeister. This is a hand trap that was released in 2010, and has the effect where, if your opponent activates a card in their graveyard, you can send this card from your hand to the graveyard to negate that effect. This card was power corrupt by another hand trap known as Ghost Bell and Haunted Mansion, which came out in 2018. Ghost Bell has the effect that if your opponent activates a card or effect which would move a card in the graveyard to their hand deck or extra deck, or special summon a monster from the graveyard, or banish a card from the graveyard, then you can send this card from your hand to the graveyard in order to negate that activation. So it just covers more bases in Skullmeister, and if you want to stop effects that involve the graveyard, Ghost Bell and Haunted Mansion covers just about everything. However, Ghost Bell is a hard once per turn, whereas Skullmeister is not. And that's why Skullmeister sees play. It is technically an inferior version, but you can only use one ghost spell. But all copies of Skullmeister in your hand are live, and if you really want to shut down your opponent's graveyard, then Skullmeister is just better to have multiple copies in your hand, and usually played alongside DD Crow, who has the same distinction. Technically a weaker version than Ghost Spell and Haunted Mansion, but is not once per turn. It also has a distinction where it's a dark attribute, and has a higher baseline attack, so it has the option to be normal summoned in an emergency. But really, the most important part is the fact that it's not a once per turn, and is also generally played alongside Ghost Bell and Haunted Mansion anyway, as well as DD Grow. A lot of the power crept cards basically see play because they just want to use more copies of that card's effect. And at number 3, we have Polymerization. This is a card that came out in 2002 and was basically required in order to go into fusion monsters. And since it was required, it was pretty basic in how it was used, where you can only use monsters on your field or in your hand. Fusion monsters were not very popular in the early days of the game. Or if they were used, they weren't brought out with polymerization generally. If you only use two materials with polymerization, that's a minus two in card advantage. So you need to bring out something really good with the cards in order to justify all the resources you're losing. That's why polymerization has been power crept like crazy, where if an archetype has fusion monsters, Generally, they'll just print an archetype-specific polymerization so that you don't have to use this card. And they also just printed more powerful versions of polymerization, in the form of Super Polymerization in 2008, which allows you to use your opponent's monsters as well as your own, and a spell speed 4, so it's one of the most powerful removal cards in the game at the moment. Then there's also Fusion Substitute, which came out in 2014, and literally treats its name as polymerization while it's in the deck. So any card that works on Poly also works on Fusion Substitute and basically only allows you to use materials on your side of the field for a fusion summon, but has a nice graveyard effect that allows you to return a fusion monster from your graveyard back to the extra deck in order to draw one card. And then in 2017, they released Ultra Polymerization, which also only allows you to use monsters on your side of the field, but has a graveyard effect that allows you to special summon the fusion materials from the graveyard. And even with these better polymerizations and the plethora of archetype-specific polys, with cards like Thunder Dragon Fusion, which allows you to use banished cards as a fusion material, and has a graveyard effect that allows you to go plus one, or even Neos Fusion, which allows you to fusion some with cards from the deck and protects monsters from the graveyard, the original bad polymerization still sees competitive play, but mainly in hero decks and some variants of Lunalite decks. Hero decks have a monster called Vision Hero Vion, who has the effect where it can send a hero monster from your deck to the graveyard when it's summoned, and then has the effect where it can banish a hero monster from your graveyard to add polymerization from your deck to your hand. And since both of those effects are good, 
and this card is very easy to bring out in hero decks. Usually, hero decks will play polymerization just because Vision Hero Vion gives them an easy way to search it out. And they have a way to recycle it with Extra Hero Wonder Driver. And hero decks occasionally see competitive play, and including recently. So polymerization is just a stable card in hero decks because of Vision Hero Vion. So it still sees competitive play because of that. Even though hero decks themselves have better fusion spell cards, like Miracle Fusion or Dark Calling. And at number two, we have Effect Veiler. This is a hand trap which was released in 2010, and it has the effect where you can send this card from your hand to the graveyard during your opponent's main phase in order to negate the effects of one monster your opponent controls until the end of the turn. This effect is incredibly useful against all kinds of decks, so Effect Veiler has seen competitive play ever since it came out. But in 2018, a new card was released called Infinite Impermanence, which is a trap card that can be activated from your hand if you control no cards, and also allows you to negate the effects of one of your opponent's monsters until the end of the turn. But also, Infinite Impermanence, if set as a trap card, gains an additional effect, where it negates the effects of all spell and trap cards in the same column as this card until the end of the turn. So it can be used as an effect veiler during your opponent's first turn, and even after it's no longer live from your hand, it has an even better on-field effect that can allow it to negate a monster effect and spell or trap cards, assuming you're able to place it in the correct column. And since Infinite Impermanence is just a better effect veiler, especially since it can't be negated by monsters that negate monster effects, it's just kind of eclipsed Effect Veiler in usefulness. There's no reason to play Effect Veiler anymore if you can just use Infinite Impermanence instead. Now, the reason Effect Veiler still sees competitive play is because it's played alongside Infinite Impermanence, usually in trap-heavy decks or zodiacs. If the person who's playing those decks just really wants hand traps to negate monster effects, and three copies of Infinite Impermanence aren't enough, they'll also throw in copies of Effect Veiler. Plus, Effect Veiler has the nice distinction where it's also a level 1 tuner monster, which is sometimes useful, but really, the reason Effect Veiler still sees play is just because it's used alongside Infinite Impermanence. Infinite Impermanence is just one of the most played cards in the game, period, and playing Effect Veiler just gives them more chances to draw a card in their hand than has effect negation. So it doesn't see anywhere near as much play as Infinite Impermanence, but still sees a lot more play than all the other cards on this list so far. And at number one, we have Pot of Duality. This card was released in 2010, and basically only allows you to go hand neutral, where it allows you to excavate the top three cards of your deck and then add one of them to your hand. The other cards are then shuffled back into your deck, and also, you cannot special summon the turn you activate this effect. It also has a hard once per turn, so you can't use multiple copies in the same turn. But a hand neutral effect that allows you to choose one of three cards is very good. So, even though it has a restriction where you can't special summon the turn you use the effect, that didn't really stop the card from seeing a whole bunch of competitive play over the years. Now, this card has been power crept a little bit by two other cards known as Pot of Desires and Pot of Extravagance. Two cards which allow you to draw two cards instead of one, while also having pretty big downsides as well. And being able to go plus one with downsides is better than being able to go plus zero with downsides. So generally, there's no reason to use Pot of Duality when two better cards exist. And Pot of Desires and Pot of Extravagance see a heavy amount of competitive play, in the same tiers as Infinite Impermanence of just seeing play in almost all decks. Now, the reason Pot of Duality keeps seeing play despite the fact that it's been power crept is because some decks don't special summon a lot during their turn, and the effect of duality is still good. So decks like Subterror, Altergeist, and Grand Maju who play a lot of trap cards and special summon mainly during their opponent's turn, are perfectly fine with playing Pot of Duality for the excellent effect to choose one to three at the top of their deck, and generally don't mind not being able to special summon during their turn. But also, Pot of Duality is just played alongside Pot of Desires and Pot of Extravagance. Usually, not both of them at the same time, but there are some decks that have all three of these pot cards in them. Usually in decks that can't play both of them, but still want that draw power and don't really special summon during their turn. And Pot of Duality just sees more play than all the other cards on this list, only really beating Effect Veiler and topping spots by a small margin. Where really, Effect Veiler and Pot of Duality are the two powerhouses of cards in this list, who still see competitive play, despite being power crept so hard. Except one distinction Pot of Duality has over Effect Veiler is that it's been power crept twice and still sees play. Whereas Effect Veiler has only been power crept a single time. A win more card in Yu-Gi-Oh! describes a card that can only be activated when you're already in an advantageous game state. In which case the effect gives you an even greater advantage to help you win the game even more. 
The problem with these cards is that if you can use them, you were probably going to win anyway, and the card placement in your deck could have gone to more staples that would have helped you get into that winning state in the first place. So starting at number 10, we have Neutron Blast. This is a normal spell card which has the effect where if you control a fusion summon Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon, you can make three attacks during the battle phase this turn. Additionally, your opponent can't activate any cards or effects when it makes those attacks. And the Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon has 4500 attack and no other effects, so having one of those things swing for three attacks can basically win you the game if even two of those hit directly, or if it attacks into monsters with less than 5500 total attack. So basically, if you get this effect off and successfully attack with the monster, there's a good chance you can win the game. However, one of the caveats to the card is the fact that you need to have a fusion summoned Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon specifically, and it only works on the original Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon. There are two other Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon fusion monsters, which require the exact same materials as the non-effect version. However, Neutron Blast does not work on them, even though it would be much better if it did. However, the Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon did see more competitive play over the years than its other two counterparts, because of its distinction of being a non-effect monster that can be cheated out with Fist of the Unrivaled Tenyi, and being one of the highest attack monsters you can cheat out of the extra deck in the early days of the game with Cyberstein. However, Neutron Blast does not work if the monster is cheated out of the extra deck, as it has to be fusion summoned properly. So if you do manage to fusion summon the Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon, chances are you're in a very advantageous game state, where you don't really need Neutron Blast in order to win the game. Or you dedicate all your resources to getting it out, and you don't have any resources to protect Ultimate Dragon if it gets destroyed by any kind of destruction effect. It's an incredibly impractical card to use because of how hard the monster it's used on is to get out. But if you do get it out to successfully resolve its effect and attack, you'll probably win. And at number 9, we have Nordic Relic Svalin. This is a continuous trap card which has two effects. The first one is if you control an Izer monster, you can use its quick effect in order to negate the effects of all face-up cards your opponent controls until the end of the turn. Additionally, you can tribute a Nordic monster in order to special summon an Izer monster from your graveyard, and it shares a hard once per turn between both of its effects. Now, what makes this card a win more card is purely the fact that it requires an Izer monster to be on the field. The Izer monsters are level 10 synchros, which have incredibly convoluted summoning requirements, and were very difficult to bring out before the Link era, where pretty much all of the Nordic cards that only worked on the Izer monsters were purely win more, because of how difficult those level 10 synchro monsters were to get out. However, the archetype received some new support and we're one of the lucky legacy archetypes to receive a powerful Link 1 monster, in the form of Gulveig of the Nordic Ascendant, which makes bringing out the level 10 Synchro monsters much easier by bringing out three Nordic monsters from your deck, which you can just use them to go into Synchro some of the boss monsters very easily. And because it's so much easier to go into the Izir monsters, modern Nordic decks actually run Nordic Relics Fail in and just use it as a normal part of their play to negate all your opponent's cards once per turn. It's essentially a full board negate, and you can use it to negate either monster or spell and trap cards. Or, if you time it well enough, you can do both at the same time. Because remember, this effect is tied to a continuous trap card, which means you can use this effect whenever you want at spell speed 2, as long as you meet the conditions, which is to simply control an Izer monster on the field. So it can be used as a form of disruption in order to disrupt your opponent's plays once during both players' turns, like a board-wide repeatable imperm. If anything, the only reason this card is number 9 is because it's one of the only win more cards in this list that actually is played in the archetype. However, Nordics do have some other more Widmore cards, namely all the other Nordic Relics, or even Solemn Authority, which is another card that only works with Izer monsters. Basically, if a card only works with incredibly hard to bring up monsters, it almost always falls into the Widmore category, like our next card on this list. And at number 8, we have Fist of Fate. This is a quick play spell card that only works if you have Oblis of Torment on your side of the field, where its effects can be negated, and it has the effect to negate the effects of one effect monster your opponent controls, destroy it, then apply a lingering effect where your opponent can't use any monster effects of that card's name for the rest of the turn. Additionally, if this card is activated during your main phase, you can destroy all of your opponent's spell and trap cards. So it's kind of like an infinite impermanence tied to a call by the grave effect and a harpy's feather duster while also being an uncounterable effect, so the effect on paper seems kind of amazing. The problem is that it requires a hard to bring up monster to be on the field to use it, and Albus the Tormentor requires three tributes for the normal summon, and also gets rid of itself during the end phase if you manage to special summon it. Modern support has made bringing an opposite Tormentor a lot easier, but not easy enough for Fist of Fate to have reached the same tier as Nordic Relics Favelin, where it can be realistically played alongside the main card that allows it to do its job. If anything, Fist of Fate is an excellent example of win more cards, because it has so many good effects tied to it, and it's still not very good, simply because of the activation requirement of requiring you to have a hard to bring out monster. Additionally, the other specific god cards kind of fit this bill, 
I just chose Fist of Fate because it seemed like the best of the bunch, when compared to Blaze Cannon or Thunder Force Attack. And at number 7, we have Super Quantal Mech Sword Magnus Slayer. This is a trap card which equips itself to a Super Quant XC's monster you control, where it gives it attack equal to its rank times 100, as well as piercing battle damage. It has an additional effect, where during the battle phase you can send this card to the graveyard in order to make it so the monster it's equipped to can make 3 attacks this turn. So, if you have this card combined with Super Quantal Mech King Great Magnus, which has 3600 attack, it can win you the game if the field is clear enough, which is more accomplishable than Neutron Blast, since Magnus actually has an effect that removes monsters from the field. And if it has enough materials attached, it also has a lot more survivability than the non-effect Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon. And since the whole archetype for Super Quantals is basically trying to bring out their boss monster anyway, it seems like having a big finisher would be a great idea. Although, people who play the deck often joke that Super Quantal Mech Sword is more of a lose more card rather than a win more, simply because one of the advantages that Neutron Blast has over Super Quantal Mech Sword is the fact that at least Neutron Blast is a spell card and can be activated from your hand immediately. Whereas Mech Sword is a trap card, so you have to wait a turn before you're able to use it. And seeing as it's already a win more card, having to wait even longer to use it generally makes the card almost unplayable. Because you have to remember, when it comes to big boss monsters that take a ton of resources to bring out, just bringing the card out in the first place is a pretty difficult task when you're just trying to play through your opponent's disruption, as any good opponent is trying to stop you from bringing out those big boss monsters. So if you have effects that you can just use on a boss monster in the field, it almost doesn't matter what the effect is because it's probably not going to be worth it. However, in this case, it works on any other Super Quantal Mech monster and not just your big boss monster. And allowing any of those cards to attack three times is going to be good. So it's still worth it on this list anyway. If it was tied to only the big boss monster, it probably wouldn't be on this list because it wouldn't be good enough. But the versatility of being usable on the smaller Super Quant monsters as well means it won't be as dead as having Fist of Fate in your hand. And at number 6, we have 3 of a kind. This is a trap card that can only be activated if you have 3 or more monsters in the field that have the exact same name, except for tokens. And if you meet these conditions, you get to target 3 cards your opponent controls and destroy them. So the card is actually a plus 2 in card advantage, as it gets rid of 3 cards for only using one of your own cards, as you don't have to consume any of the monsters you need on the field in order to accomplish this great effect. However, the condition is to have 3 monsters of the same name on your side of the field, which is incredibly difficult to accomplish. Even in decks with monsters who can change their name to the card, like the Cyber Dragon shown in the card artwork, have a hard time getting three cards of the same name on the field and keeping them there during your opponent's turn, where you're able to use this card. As having three targeted pops with one card is a very good effect, because it also works on spells and traps in addition to monsters. Although, with like all of these win more cards, the reason this card doesn't really see very much play is purely because if you can use it, you're probably in a pretty good board state anyway, where you don't need the kind of effect it offers. If it did a little bit more than just destroy three cards, it would probably be worth it, which is kind of hilarious considering destroying three cards is already a really good effect. And at number 5, we have Yata Garasu. This is a level 2 spirit monster which was banned for almost 20 years, and recently came off the ban list without an errata. And after coming off the ban list, hasn't really seen any competitive play, purely because of the fact it's almost entirely a win more card in modern Yu-Gi-Oh! Where it has the effect that if you inflict battle damage to your opponent, your opponent skips their next draw phase. So, if you manage to get ahead and get rid of all of your opponent's cards, and then attack with Yadagarasu, you can kind of lock them out of being able to come back in the game without the draw phase. However, if you're behind on board space, or in any other way, Yadagarasu isn't a help at all because it can't be special summoned and only has that one battle-related effect, with a pretty weak body of only 200 attack as well. If anything, nothing really encompasses a win more card like Yadagarasu. If you're ahead and get the effect off, it can definitely make you more ahead. But the main reason this card has been so long on the ban list was purely because of how degenerate it can be rather than how good it actually is. And at number 4, we have Goki Cage Match. This is a field spell for the Goki archetype, which is an archetype that saw tons of competitive play. And what it does is, when it's activated, you place 3 counters on it. Then each time one of your Goki monsters destroys one of your opponent's monsters by battle, you get to remove one of the counters from the card. And at the end of the battle phase, if the last of its counters was removed with its effect, you get to special summon as many Goki monsters as you want with different names from your hand or deck, where you then get to place three counters on this card again so you can try to get the effect off in your subsequent turns. So, if for some reason you have a clear field at the end of the battle phase, Goki Cage Match can allow you to special summon five monsters from your deck, which is an incredibly good effect for a card to have. And with how much competitive play Goki saw over the years, it may surprise you to hear this, but this card saw absolutely no competitive play within the archetype. And the reason for that kind of has to do with how the Gokis were actually played, where most of their competitive success was found in the fact 
that they all had floating effects that let you search out another Goki card when they're sent from the field to the graveyard. So if you could find a way to get Goki cards in the field, you could link climb like crazy until you ran out of hard ones per turn searches. And since Gokis were mainly used as link climbing tools, you barely actually ended on any Goki cards, which meant you weren't really destroying your opponent's monsters with Goki monsters, so they wouldn't be able to use Cage Match anyway. There were later on some builds which did incorporate some actual Goki monsters to enter the battle phase, but even then they wouldn't want to use this card because it just wasn't faster than playing Gokis without it. Although if you're already ahead in game state and had all the Goki monsters just run over your opponent's cards, this would definitely assure that you would win more with its effect. And at number 3 we have Ghost Meets a Girl, a masterful Mayakashi Shiranui Saga. This is a trap card which requires you to tribute a Mayakashi or Shiranui Synchro or Link monster in order to activate its effect where for the rest of the turn, neither player can special summon monsters from the hand, deck, or extra deck. So it's a full-on lingering effect lockdown from special summons, except from the banished zone or graveyard, which is generally where Mayakashi's and Shiranui special summon from, or have effects relating to those two zones. Additionally, it has a graveyard effect, where you can banish it from the graveyard to return one of your banished monsters to the graveyard, which is actually pretty good with zombie support. Now, Ghost Beats Girl is definitely a lot more usable when it comes to all the other cards so far, and a lot of people thought it might actually see competitive play because the effect is just that good. However, it kind of highlights the problem with win more cards, and the fact that it doesn't actually help the base strategy of the archetypes themselves, and instead can only be added on top of what they already do. And since Shiranui's and Mayakashi's aren't really competitive on their own, giving them a broken win more card isn't going to help that problem. There are cases where a single piece of card was added to an archetype and immediately made it become more successful, like with Math Mech Circular. But the reason that card works was because it supported the main engine and made the archetype itself just function better for existing, whereas Ghost Meets Girl doesn't really contribute to Mayakashi or Shirinori plays, and just makes it so you have a very good floodgate if you do manage to get off their combos. However, the effect should not really be undersold. If you do resolve the card, there's a good chance you can actually win the game. The problem is just getting to a board state where you can get to that point in the first place. And at number 2, we have World Legacy Scars. This is a field spell card which has three effects. First, it increases the attack and defense of all Mech Knight monsters by 300. Secondly, it allows you to discard Mech Knights or World Legacy cards in order to draw one card. And lastly, it has an effect where you can banish 8 different Mech Knight monsters from your graveyard or field in order to send your opponent's entire hand and extra deck to the graveyard. So, if you're able to activate the last effect of World Legacy Scars on your first turn, you can kind of win the duel right there, because there's not too many decks that can come back from having their extra deck in hand sent to the graveyard. There are some decks which can play without an extra deck, and some which can play without a hand. Not too many can play without either of them. However, the effect is incredibly difficult to get off, and if you're in a position where you have 8 different Mech Knight cards in your graveyard, chances are the duel has been going on for a while, or you're in an advantageous position where you can just kind of win without the effect. However, there have been people who tried to get off the effect anyway, and some people even found some success with trying to get off the effect on their first turn. So, out of all of these win more cards, this is one that actually kind of helps to a somewhat competitive win condition. Just not competitive enough to see widespread use outside of a single top in 2022. And at number one, we have the Six Shinobi. This is a trap card which can only be activated if you have six different Six Samurai monsters with different attributes, where you get the effect to skip your opponent's next turn. Now, this is the ultimate win more card, as it requires you to have a board state, which you would probably have won you the game anyway, in order to give you a very powerful effect that will definitely assure you win the game. Getting six different monsters with different attributes on your side of the field is incredibly difficult. Even if six Amorites have infinite loops with Gateway of the Six that allow them to summon as many monsters as they want per turn. However, even in six Samurai decks, where they can use Gateway of the Six in order to summon as much as they want, they still won't use the Six Shinobi, because it's so much easier to win in other ways. Because if you can summon as many six samurais as you want on your turn, you generally don't want to waste them trying to set up the win condition of just getting the six shinobi live. Because while skipping your opponent's turn is a very strong effect, you can also just fill a board full of unbeatable negates instead. Of course, if the six shinobi was a spell card, this would probably be a different story. But since it is a trap that you have to set and wait for a turn before being able to use it, this means it's probably never going to see actual play. Because of the anime, Yu-Gi-Oh has been ripe for potential memes ever since its inception. But even disregarding the anime, the Yugu community has managed to create a variety of fun memes, with some even being so common they even had mainstream appeal. So today we're going to get some of the 10 most interesting cards that inspired memes both inside and outside of the Yugu community, where they came from and how they managed to become memes in the first place. And with no monsters left on the field, I summon Dark Magician to this list and declare number 10. Dark Magician is one of the most iconic and recognizable monsters in Yu-Gi-Oh. Second only to the game's most iconic monster, the Blue Eyes White Dragon. Because of this, Dark Magician is one of the most well-loved monsters in both the game and anime, 
and is often used in commercials to attract both newer players and nostalgic older players to get into the game. Which is precisely why in 2017, Konami used this recognizable monster in a commercial for the recently released Duel Links, and showcased the classic Duel Monster Ace delivering the final blow to Mystic 7's opponent. Which is all well and good, but in the commercial, it seemed like duelists weren't exactly played by the rules. Because in order to bring out Dark Magician, Mystic 7 just had summoned him on the field with no monsters. The issue there is that Dark Magician is a level 7 monster, and as a result, needs a player to tribute two monsters in order to normal summon it out to the field. So unless the duelists were playing alternative format like Junior Journey, it would be impossible to normal summon out Dark Magician to the field with no monsters, since you'd need at least two monsters to tribute. And this jarring moment led to the phrase, with no monsters left on the field, I summon Dark Magician and declare a direct attack, being immortalized into the Yu-Gi-Oh community. Now, in the game state shown in the commercial, it was technically impossible to summon Dark Magician. But in the actual card game itself, it's actually really easy to summon Dark Magician while there are no monsters in the field. In fact, a lot of modern support is centered around ensuring that you can summon out Dark Magician every single turn without needing to attribute a single monster with the use of Eternal Soul. This card lets you summon out Dark Magician from your hand or graveyard for free each turn, and when paired with Dark Magic Circle, forms a really strong interruptive engine that's capable of banishing your opponent's cards each turn by summoning out your Dark Magician to the field. In fact, these cards are available to the TCG, OCG, Master Duel, and even Duel Links right now. So if you want to relive the dream of 2017 and summon out Dark Magician to the field with no monsters and attack for game, it's actually possible, and even part of Dark Magician's main game plan. You should have been prepared for it at this point. Digging in at number 9 is Mystic Mind, one of the most contentious cards in the game that's had multiple memes inspired because of it. You see, Mystic Mind is an incredibly strong floodgate that locks your opponent out of the game if they control more monsters than you do, because it stops your opponent from activating monster effects or even declaring an attack. It also comes with two of its own built-in outs though, because if you control more monsters than your opponent, you're the one locked out by your own Mystic Mind. And if both players control the same amount of monsters during the end phase, Mystic Mind will automatically destroy itself. But if you're struggling to deal with Mystic Mind, an easy solution is to just draw the out. And that goes for any Floodgate or boss monster. If your opponent ends on a Towers, just draw a Kaiju. If they end on a Floodgate, just draw Harpy's Feather Duster. And if they ended a board on infinite negates, just draw Dark Ruler and evenly match. The meme was made to highlight how oppressive Yuko could feel sometimes, because there are some board states which appear impossible to deal with unless you have the exact counter you need in your hand to deal with it. A Mystic Mind was at the forefront of this discussion, because while it was possible to draw spell and trap removal to deal with your opponent's Mystic Mind, if you didn't draw your particular out, you were in for a long and arduous game until you did. And even if you managed to find one copy of Harpy's Feather Duster in your deck, there's a strong chance your opponent has a Field Barrier or Solemn Judgment up to leave you stuck under Mystic Mind permanently. But there are two sides to every coin. While a lot of people complained about Mystic Mind, pro players such as Jesse Cotton believe that people had the wrong mindset about Mystic Mind, and instead believe that duelists should ensure that their deck is always equipped to deal with it. And as a result, Jesse tweeted out his infamous words. Okay guys, but with all due respect, how are you not prepared for Mystic Mind at this point? It's a little ridiculous to not have a well thought out plan when entering a tournament. As a result, this caused a lot of players to take Jesse's words and then replace Mystic Mind with any other absurd topic. Because seriously guys, with all due respect, how are you not prepared for 10 years Spirit Fish at this point? It's a little ridiculous not to have a well thought out plan when watching a Duel Logs video. For better or for worse, Mystic Mind was eventually banned in the TCG, meaning that players no longer had to prepare for it, making it so that this meme sort of died out. But drawing the out, at least, is an eternal struggle that will likely continue so long as the game lasts and has at least one legal floodgate. Traveling into number 8 is Dante, Traveler of the Burning Abyss. A representative of the Burning Abyss archetype, which has multiple memes associated with it, partly because it happens to be the pet deck of one of the biggest Yu-Gi-Oh streamers in Yu-Gi-Oh, Farfa. The Burning Abyss archetype is composed of monsters that all share an effect to destroy themselves if you control any monster that isn't a Burning Abyss monster. Which is why the archetype can sometimes struggle using non-Burning Abyss monsters, because the moment they're on the field, it basically locks you out of being able to summon out your main deck Malabranches. Which is why there's a lot of confusion when certain cards allow for Burning Abyss monsters to exist on the field with other non-BA monsters, causing the opponent to ask why the BA doesn't destroy itself. This can happen a number of different ways, but usually it occurs because the Burning Abyss monster was summoned off of Tour Guard from the Underworld or Libic, both of which negate the effects of the card that they summon, or they're being pointed to by Chirabini, which protects them from being destroyed by card effects, including their own. But as well as their own detrimental effects, the Burning Abyss monsters all have their own unique graveyard effects, which also led to a particular combo becoming very well known and very well memed. By linking off a Dante with a Seer attached to it as a material, you can perform the most infamous Burning Abyss combo. You can activate Seer's graveyard effect as Chain Link 1 in order to target your Dante that you sent to the graveyard to special summon it back to the field. And then, as Chain Link 2, you can activate the graveyard effect of Dante to target Seer and add it back to your hand. To put it short, Chain Link 1, Seer target Dante. Chain Link 2, Dante target Seer. This gives you everything you need to fulfill Beatrice's alternative summoning condition, since now you have a Dante monster in the field and a Burning Abyss monster in your hand to discard. 
Although in the modern era, it's not too likely that you'll be seeing this combo too much since Burning Abyss is more of a rogue contender than it is a meta deck. But back when it was first released, a lot of people believed Burning Abyss to be strong. Too strong even, and waited for the day that Dante would eventually put on the ban list for his ability to mill cards for cost. And they waited, and waited, but that day never came. So people would often joke that Dante was the hide and seek champion of the particular year for being able to dodge the ban list each time and never get hit itself. And given Burning Abyss's current status, it's unlikely that Dante is going to be hit anytime soon, so he has a lot more championship trophies to collect for years to come. And with his ability to dodge lists, this will hopefully explain why this particular BA doesn't die, even if he does get sent to the graveyard a lot. Editor's note, to add on to this a little bit more for my script writer, the reason why the BA no die became a phrase in the Yugo community is because of a moment where DZ tried to ring a destruction a BA monster being protected by Cherubini, where he says the iconic phrase. And roaring in at number 7 is a car that you might not have read before. Miscellaneous Saurus. And just in case you haven't, let's read it together in excruciating detail. Misk is a level 4 fire dinosaur effect monster with 1800 attack and 1000 defense. Its first effect is a quick effect and requires you to send it from your hand to the graveyard for costs, but it can only be used during the main phase. This effect makes it so that all of your dinosaur monsters you control are completely unaffected by your opponent's activated effects until the end of the phase, putting a stop to common hand traps and even protecting them from board breakers during your opponent's turn. Its second effect is a graveyard effect, which lets you banish it and add as many dinosaur monsters as you want to special summon a dinosaur monster from your deck with a level equal to the number of dinosaur monsters you banished, but you have to destroy it during the end phase. And this particular effect is a hard once per turn. So, now if everyone asks you if you've read Mist, you can answer yes. The meme of asking if someone has read Mist originated from Farfa, where he was talking to another player on stream and asked why Dinosaur was so strong. And the player jokingly responded, have you read Misk? To basically say that the card was so absurdly strong that it carried Dinosaur as a strategy. The community loved this clip so much that it became commonplace to lightly poke fun at people for misunderstanding Miscellaneous Source's effect, which was fairly often because despite Misk only having two effects, it's a fairly complicated card with small details that are important to remember. For example, Misk protection only lasts until the end of the phase. So if your opponent tries to preemptively protect their board of dinosaurs with misc in hand effect, you can just move on to the next phase to clear away the protection. It is also main phase only, letting you have free reign to interact with your opponent's board during the draw phase, standby, battle, and end phase. And misc only negates activated effects, so your opponent's monsters are still going to be affected if you flip up a skill drain. The card basically has a lot of small intricacies that can be easy to forget, but it did lead to some funny memes. Especially because, like with the Jesse Cotton tweet, people would often replace Misk with any other card to imply how strong it is, or to poke fun at people for misunderstanding their effects. Have you read Vishuda? But eventually, Konami did end up reading Misk, and also agreed that it was an absurd enough card to be limited, so the meme isn't around as much as it used to be since Dino is seen a lot less play. But at least you're now less likely to be caught off guard by this really powerful card. Normal summoning to number 6 is Alistair the Invoker, the star of the Invoke strategy and the deck that's often made fun of for its linear style of play. Alistair has two effects. Its first effect is a quick effect, which lets you target a fusion monster you control, and it lets it gain 1000 attack and defense until the end of the turn. But it's Alistair's second effect which made him into a big meme. Because whenever you normal summon Alistair, or flip him face up, you can add an invocation from your deck to your hand. The archetypal fusion spell which lets you go into most of your invoked monsters. This effect made the invoked engine quite strong, because it meant that you can go into a negate off of just a single card. By normal summoning Alistair, you could search for invocation, then you can link it off Alistair into a Salmagrid Almirage, and then link off Almirage into a Secure Gardener. This gives you a light monster in the field and puts Alistair in your graveyard, so that you can use the effect Invocation to banish both Alistair and the Secure Gardener to fuse into Invoked Macaba. Then, with the graveyard effect of Invocation, you can shuffle it into your deck and add Alistair back to your hand, which gives you a free card to use for Invoked Macaba's Negate. And because this is a one card engine that put a Negate on your board, the Invoked engine saw a lot of competitive play both as an engine in decks that didn't need their normal summon, and even as its own deck where it was combined with Dogmatica's engine. But as a result of its commonplace use, a lot of players started to get annoyed by how often they were seeing Alistair the Invoker, and how linear the Invoked engine usually was since it was the exact same combo every time. As a result, people would often joke about this repetitive line by repeating with just the phrase, Normal Summon Alistair, which is meant to imply the whole singular card line since virtually every player knew what it did. There were some variations of the meme too. Some players got so tired of the phrase Normal Summon Alistair that they began to say Special Summon Alistair instead, which does nothing, but it's absurd enough to be funny. And sometimes players will instead use a different card instead of Alistair, depending on what their main playstarter is and implying this simple combo from there. The meme has fallen out of favor a bit since the Invoked Engine hasn't really seen too much recent play, but with how often it was repeated and how many people now know of Alistair's effect, it's definitely become immortalized in the minds of Yu-Gi-Oh! community. And firing up to this list number 5 is Salaman Great Sunlight Wolf. Oh, was that the 5th entry? Tributing into number 5 is Nibiru the Primal Being. Nibiru's impact in the game cannot be understated. 
Because ever since its release, it's a hand trap that's always had to be on the minds of duelists when deck building. Because if you summon 5 or more times in one turn, your opponent can activate the effect into beer during the main phase and tribute the entire field, leaving you with only a Primal Bean token left on your field, a vanilla token that might have decent stats depending on what was tributed. As a result, Nibir's presence in the game caused a lot of deck builders to consider finding a way to get some kind of monster negate either before or on their fifth summon, so that if their opponent has Nibir, they at least have a way of negating it so they can keep their board. But there are plenty of strategies that have no way to reach a negate before the fifth summon occurs, which often results in them being Nibiru, so people often joke and say the most common end board in certain decks is the Primal Bean token. The two most common victims of this joke are Salmon Great and Hero, both of which can put up impressive end boards if given the chance since Salad has amazing trap cards and Hero has Dark Law and Plasma, but they often struggle to find a way to play around Nibiru, which results in their whole board basically being countered by a single card and all the resources being pulled into giving the Primal Bean token a lot of attack and defense points. This is at least a consolation prize, as some decks, like Plunder Patrol, can actually struggle to deal with the high stats that a Primal Bean token can reach. But it's definitely not as good as keeping your usual end board, and the best decks in the game are usually ones that have some way of playing around Nibiru whether by summoning 4 or fewer times a turn, or by making sure they can have some kind of negate up by the 5th summon. As a result, some decks are so worried about Nibiru, they'll often count how many summons they have occurred in their head, just to make sure they're not accidentally played into it and could cost them the game. Which is why the phrase, was that your 5th summon, became a statement to be feared. Blowing into number 4 is Mystical Space Typhoon, another one of Yu-Gi-Oh's most iconic cards, that has a particularly well-known meme associated with it because of a misunderstanding of how the card works. Which is strange at first glance because Mystical Space Typhoon's effect is actually quite simple, as all it does is target a spell or trap card in the field and destroy it. But in the past, people were often confused about what the term destroy even meant, and would sometimes use Mystical Space Typhoon in response to a spell or trap card to destroy it in hopes that removing it from the field that its effect would also be negated, resulting in the meme of MST negating. Unfortunately, however, this isn't how Mystical Space Typhoon works, because even if an activated spell is removed from the field or destroyed, its effect will still go through. Because all Mystical Space Typhoon did in this instance is destroy the card itself without actually interacting with the card's effect. So if you activate your Mystical Space Typhoon to destroy your opponent's activated Rite of Aramisir, or Welcome Labyrinth, that's usually a mistake and just a minus one in terms of card advantage. But even though this meme usually isn't true, there are some instances where Mystical Space Typhoon basically acts like a negate. Because while it can't really interact with normal spell or trap card effects, Mystical Space Typhoon is incredible against continuous spell and trap effects, field spells, and pendulum monsters acting as spell cards. All of these card types usually need to remain face up on the field in order to actually resolve their effects. So, if you chain MST to their activation or effect, they'll usually resolve without effect, which isn't technically a negate, but results in a similar outcome. There's even ways to negate some normal spells with MST, but it heavily depends on the card text. Rage with Eyes of Blue requires you to banish it and all cards from your hand, field and graveyard face down in order to summon out three blue eyes from your deck. But if you use Mystical Space Typhoon on Rage, it becomes a different card in the graveyard, so it can no longer banish itself from the field in order to fulfill its summoning conditions. Which means that it can't summon any blue eyes white dragons, and MST causes it to resolve without effect. Even though MST negates does come from a place of misunderstanding how the game works, it's interesting to see that there is some truth behind the meme that you'll be able to understand more as you gain more knowledge of the game. It is, at least, usually a bad idea to interact with normal spells using MST, but you never know when it might save the day. And laying out the paths of destiny at number 3 is actually a card that doesn't exist in the TCG, OCG, Master Duel, Duel Links, or any other format. It only exists in the anime, Dramatic Crossroads. In the anime, Dramatic Crossroads was used by Chaz Princeton in the Yu-Gi-Oh! GX duel against Alexis Rhodes, and in a bid to see if she loved him more, he activated Dramatic Crossroads after he took battle damage. Crossroads has two effects, but it's up to your opponent to decide which one is activated. The first effect causes your opponent to randomly discard a card from their hand, which is pretty bad for your opponent, but not the end of the world. But the second effect is something that the opponent is likely never to pick, because it lets you look at your opponent's hand and choose a card in it to add to your hand which means that they go card neutral while you go minus one in terms of card advantage, while the first effect at least means you both go minus one. In terms of the meme though, the effect of Dramatic Crossroads isn't too relevant. What is relevant, however, is the card's artwork. Dramatic Crossroads art is actually a really popular meme template outside of the Yugi community. It managed to meet meme status all on its own because of how its artwork depicted two crossing paths. In these memes, the shining path is often used to depict a positive thing, the dark path a negative thing, and the boy as someone or something that can go one of two ways which led to its popularity because it made it very similar to a lot of other popular meme formats and meant that it could be used in similar ways. Dramatic Crossroads is likely to be the second most, if not the most widespread meme on this list, 
but it's not as high as it could be because it's not based on a real card. And it didn't really take off in Yu-Gi-Oh circles, just in mainstream meme circles. But the number two spot on this list definitely is one of the most popular memes in the Yu-Gi-Oh community. Drawing in to number two is Pot of Greed, which has created one of the most infamous memes in the community all thanks to the anime. Yu-Gi-Oh was, and still is, a very complicated game, which sometimes made duels in the anime fairly difficult to keep up with. So in order to make sure the people watching could understand the duel, characters would often clearly announce the card that they were playing alongside a brief exclamation of what the card does. But when it came to commonly used cards in the series, their effects were often repeated a lot. And because Pot of Greed was such a common staple, its effect got explained so many times to the point of redundancy. And because of that, people would then begin to jokingly ask and ponder what Pot of Greed actually does, since it was apparently such a complicated card that it had to be explained every single time. So, what does Pot of Greed actually do? Pot of Greed is a normal spell card that lets you draw two cards from your deck. It's one of the game's most iconic cards and saw extensive play from its release until it was eventually banned. But because of its use in the anime, Pot of Greed memes have managed to last throughout the game's entire history, becoming a part of Yugo's identity as a card game and one of the biggest memes in the community. There is no real modern equivalent of Pot of Greed in terms of widespread memes, but Pot of Desires, at least in the Yu-Gi-Oh community, comes somewhat close. People often fear desires drawn into another copy of Desires. This was actually memes on so much that it eventually encouraged people to only play two copies of Desires just because they didn't want to lessen the chances of drawing another copy of it off their original Desires. And because you had to banish 10 cards on top of your deck, people would also meme about it being a minus 9 in terms of card advantage. Because even though you were adding 2 cards to your hand, you lost 10 cards on the top of your deck, which could have potentially banished engine pieces or important what ofs in your strategy. So, if you had a bad banish of desires, you could say that you went minus 9. But in terms of mass appeal, only one meme has managed to surpass Pot of Greed, and has become popular both in the Yu-Gi-Oh community and mainstream circles alike. And obliterating to the number one spot is Exodia the Forbidden One and all of its associated pieces. In terms of the Yu-Gi-Oh anime, no moment will ever be as iconic as Yugi managing to assemble the five pieces of Exodia to defeat Kaiba. It was many people's first introduction to Yu-Gi-Oh, and that moment made them want to play the game. It's why Exodia has become such a fan-favorite archetype, and why many players, even in the modern day, will attempt this unique alternative win condition for the chance of being able to relive the anime. And because of how well-loved it is, this iconic anime moment has been used both in the Yu-Gi-Oh! and mainstream community in different memes. Yugi's mind crush moment was heavily popularized in the Yu-Gi-Oh! Bridge series, while Exodia Obliterate is a catchphrase that duelists will often use when they manage to succeed in assembling the five pieces. Sometimes, a perfect-handed Yu-Gi-Oh! is often described as drawing Exodia, even if it's not exactly the five pieces of Exodia. And there are even several different meme edits which show Exodia being replaced by some other powerful being with the use of custom cards. But probably the most popular modern meme based off Exodia is this one, with Kaiba showing off his blue eyes and Yugi showing the head of Exodia to leave Kaiba in shock. The meme is often used as a template, both by the Yugi community and the mainstream meme community, to showcase having the direct counter to someone's card or argument, and leaving them in shambles and meshes well with a lot of other popular meme formats. But even though Exodia is very memeable, there have actually been a few times in the game's history where it was one of, if not the best deck that could be played. For example, when Sand, Gan, and Witch of the Black Forest were first released, their effects stated that as soon as they hit the graveyard, you got to trigger their particular search effect. Which meant that at the time, you could search easily all five pieces of Exodia in one turn by drawing and discarding Sand, Gan, and Witch with the effect of Graceful Charity, as well as a huge deep draw engine. Sand, Gan, and Witch were eventually eroded, however, to need to be sent from the field to the graveyard, which made this strategy a bit less effective especially after Pot of Greed and Graceful Charity were banned. But Exodia also managed to reach the top 8 in the 2012 world event, where it relied on the new draw engine focus on Hope for Escape and Upstart Goblin, as well as a few cards like Vabaku to stall out until they managed to assemble each of the 5 pieces. But whether or not Exodia is good or a bad strategy in any particular time, it's always going to remain in people's hearts as one of the big reasons that they got into Yu-Gi-Oh! Which is probably why this moment in the anime has been memed so often. It's iconic, it's cool, and reminds people of the childhood memories of the game which is why Exodia is the number one meme in the Yugi community, and why it will probably never be overshadowed. Editor's note. To add on to this, in other card games, if they have strategies that rely on them winning in one turn with a combo that is basically an alternative win condition, it's usually referred to as an Exodia deck. Like Exodia Mage in Hearthstone, that would use the card Tide Warp to take an extra turn, and use that extra turn to win the game if they assemble the right pieces in their hand for their combo. Due to not having a set rotation, Yu-Gi-Oh! is a game where cards are just as likely to become broken due to some new crazy interaction as they are to becoming power crept instead. In this video, we're going to go over cards which used to be banned until the game's pace caught up and allowed them to leave the Forbidden list. Starting us off at number 10, we have Yata Garasu. This is a level 2 fiend spirit monster with 200 attack and 100 defense. It has the usual spirit monster effects where it cannot be special summoned and returns to the hand at the end phase. And it has the effect where if it inflicts battle damage to your opponent, 
they skipped their next draw phase. Yadagarasu got banned because of interacting with another card that was so broken it needed to be eroded to come back into the game, Chaos Emperor Dragon and Void of the End. If you activate Chaos Emperor Dragon's effect while having Sangan or Witch of the Black Forest on the field, you'd wipe the whole field and then search Yada to lock your opponent out of their draw phase with zero cards in hand. This terrifying combo was the main play Chaos decks of old wanted to execute, which they could do with crazy consistency due to all the consistency spells legal at the time. The existence of this tier 1 deck back in the day was actually the main reason why they started banning cards out of the game entirely with a forbidden list, instead of just limiting them. Yada was certainly the weakest part of that 3 card combo, yet it was the piece that stayed in the list for the longest time. Though to be fair, the others all only ever came off the ban list due to receiving mechanical erratas. This card was kept on the ban list for almost 20 years, alongside the other draw denying card Time Seal, but they were almost certainly only there to be made an example of more than anything else. The heavy restrictions of spirit monsters stopped all but the most impactful ones from seeing play throughout the years, like Dark Dust Spirit being able to blow up the whole field, or Amano Iwato locking monster effects out entirely. This card wasn't really useful by itself even back in the day, and so of course it saw no play when it finally came off the ban list. And that's why it only makes it the 10th spot on this list. And coming in at number 9, we have Magician of Faith. This is a level 1 flip spellcaster, when flipped up, can target a spell card in your graveyard and add it back to your hand. Magician of Faith was a staple of many early Yu-Gi-Oh formats, where flip monsters were still incredibly prevalent. The most powerful cards in the game at the time were spells, none of which were once per turn. Resolving a pot of greed or premature burial once could often turn the tables in a duel, and being able to do so twice could easily guarantee a win. Despite Magician of Faith being limited, it could also often be reused with another popular monster at the time, Tsukiyomi who could set it face down each turn as long as you had a way to protect it. This card was easily searchable from the deck as well through the Apprentice Magician engine, which floats into face down Magician of Faith straight from the deck and was a popular engine for Monarch decks. For all of this, Magician of Faith rightfully earned its slot of the ban list for several years, returning only at the tail end of the Xyz era and without much fanfare. By then, flip monsters have been mostly phased out of the meta as the game got exponentially faster. The only ones that still saw play were easily searchable and provide more utility and advantage within their own archetypes, such as Gear Gaia Armor getting you a search every turn, or Raiko being removal that also milled cards from the deck. Though this card did manage to see some play sometime later on in a few chain burn decks as a way to recycle chain strike and pots. It's usually not seen as much more than a piece of Yu-Gi-Oh's history nowadays. And at number 8 we have Thousand Eyes Restrict. This is a level 1 dark spellcaster fusion monster that requires specifically relinquished and thousand eyes idol as its materials. It has a floodgate effect where other monsters in the field cannot attack or change their battle positions and also, once per turn, it can absorb a monster your opponent controls. It gains the stats of the equipped monster and can also destroy it to protect itself from battle destruction. Thousand eyes was one of the most powerful control tools in early Yu-Gi-Oh and was a huge part of GOAT format historically, one of the most popular retro formats to this day. Despite requiring two really bad monsters as materials, this card had plenty of ways of being cheated out back in the day. The best way to do this was with Metamorphosis tributing any level 1 monster. This could either be spent utility monsters, such as Magician of Faith, or Scapegoat Tokens. This interaction with using Scapegoat Tokens Metamorphosis to bring out Thousand Eyes is the reason why Goat Format has its name, as the combo was present in most decks for the time. This card would not only act as removal, but also put a total lockdown on the game by freezing attacks and flip monsters and it could even be reused with Tsukiyomi, just like Magician of Faith. Thousand Eyes Restrict stayed around a decade on the list, and surprisingly, it actually managed to see play once again. While Metamorphosis wasn't legal anymore, Instant Fusion was, and it could check this card out without even requiring Tribute Fodder. Though it wasn't the game-ending threat it once was, it was still a pretty nice piece of removal against your opponent's monsters, which only got better with Link Summoning, as you could absorb an opponent's monster and then link this card off as an extender. And coming in at number 7, we have Cyberstein. This is a level 2 dark machine that lets you pay 5,000 life points to special summon any fusion monster from your extra deck in attack position. Cyberstein was part of an extremely powerful OTK strategy in early Yu-Gi-Oh! By bringing out either Cyber and Dragon or Cyber Twin Dragon, you could make up the huge cost by inflicting just as much damage to your opponent, and if you comboed him with either Mega Morph for a little bit of removal, you'd hit with over 8,000 points of damage instead. There were multiple ways to get Stein, since you could bring it out from the deck with either Last Wheel or Mystic Tomato. These decks would often max out on ways to get their combos through, since Cyberstein could really only be activated once per duel, so they'd often play cards like Cold Wave, Giant True Nade, and even Royal Decree to stop any pesky back row from getting in the way. There just wasn't enough counterplay to the strategy, especially when coupled with the previous tech cards, which turned this into not only one of the first OTK strategies in Yu-Gi-Oh!, but also the first to get an emergency ban list for itself after it took over Attorney. 
Cyrus Time would then remain banned for several years, only being allowed back at one copy when the game was well into the Link era. In theory, this card could only get better with years as stronger and stronger fusion monsters would be released, like Nature Exterior, which can lock your opponent out of all spell and traps by itself. And also, life points mattered a lot less as a resource than ever before. But on the other hand, needing extra deck slots for this hard to search out monster with no special summon condition was a hard sell even if it could, in theory, win a game by itself. This card was also very notorious in both modern Yu-Gi-Oh! video games. In Duel Links, it was used together with a skill that cheated life point cost to bring out Ojama King, which ended the duel by itself due to the fewer zones, locking your opponent out of using any monsters for the game. In Master Duel, it was the centerpiece of one of the infamous bot pilot FTKs that used it to cycle through the effects to copy less independent Nightingale, while cheating the life point cost to kill your opponent on your first turn of the duel. And at number 6, we have Pot of Avarice. This is a normal spell card that requires you to target five monsters in your graveyard and then shuffle them all back into your deck to draw two cards. Avarice was one of the first stabs Konami took at fixing Pot of Greed by giving it an activation requirement. For the time, needing five different monsters in your graveyard was a big enough requirement to balance it somewhat by making it a brick for the first turn of the duel. Still, the format was slow enough to accommodate for this, turning this into an instant staple. Avarice was great as a way for monarchs to reuse their tribute monsters later on in the duel after they were spent and would only get better with the eventual release of Card Trooper to help accelerate its condition even further. Even back then, this would earn this card its place in the limited list, where it would stay for a couple of years. Pot of Everest would get much better with the release of Synchro Summoning, as now there were much more reliable ways to fill up your graveyard for that draw too. Popular cards of the time, such as Rescue Cat and Lone Fire Blossom, were very easy ways to get lots of monsters into the graveyard, while also giving you powerful synchros or boss monsters at the same time. This card would eventually be put back on the limited list as more and more ways to quickly get it live were released, until it eventually got banned due to how powerful it became in combo decks like Mermails, which filled the graveyard effortlessly. Avarice would stay banned before finally being freed at the start of Master Rule 4.5, together with a slew of other changes to the list. By then, despite seeming like the kind of card that would only get better with time, it wasn't strong enough to see play in most decks. There was now plenty of competition in the Draw 2 department, and pretty much only Zodiac and sometimes Sky Striker decks had a really easy time making it live off of a single card, due to how these decks can spam extra deck summons on top of a single monster. And at number 5, we have Raigeki, an extremely iconic normal spell that just destroys all monsters your opponent controls. Raigeki was yet another one of those powerful spells, which were only legal at one copy almost since their release and would become banned as soon as Forbidden List became a thing. A costless mass removal card like this was just too strong for early Yu-Gi-Oh, where negates came at a high cost, and monsters that floated on any destruction were few and far in between. Even Dark Hole, a strictly worse version of Raigeki outside of a few cases, was seen as too strong to remain in the game at the time, due to how hard it was to get back your board positioning after it resolved. This card would remain on the ban list for several years, and it even got a weaker retrain in Lightning Vortex, which destroyed only face-up monsters for a discard cost, and that was good enough to see play for quite a few years as well. Raigeki would only return to the game in one of the first few sets of the Pendulum era, where it would become a staple in almost every deck again. Even in a meta filled with lots of floaters or protected monsters, Raigeki was still a very powerful tool to punish overextension and push for game on an empty board. Even before it had come off, Dark Hole, which got freed several years before, already saw lots of play for the same reason. They'd both remain quite decent going second tools, and there were even quite a few metas where the top decks were really vulnerable to them. But overall, their value would decrease with years. More and more board-breaking tools slowly broke into the meta, such as Evenly Match being able to banish cards face down from the board instead, or Interrupted Kaiju Slumber giving you a huge beater while also clearing the board. This and the fact that the game would slowly move towards putting more and more negates on the end board turned this previously banned staple into something that only occasionally saw play in side decks, and it's even at 3 nowadays in the TCG. And coming in at number 4, we have Monster Reborn, a normal spell that lets you revive a monster in either player's graveyard. This is one of these cards that has bounced between being limited and banned several times in the game's lifespan. Monster Reborn has always been an incredibly versatile card that wasn't really dead at any point in the duel and would generally put whoever activated in a pretty good spot. In the early formats, you could very easily cheat out high-level monsters into the field to gain control of the match very quickly. The fact that this lets you revive monsters from either graveyard made this even more sacky, as you didn't even need to have seen the card at all throughout the duel to make use of it. So it's no wonder that this card was banned for ages, as even its almost completely worse counterpart, Call the Haunted, found itself on the limited list of the time as well. Konami would experiment with just limiting it for a few formats at the time, and most of the times it was this extremely annoying what of you couldn't really play around, but would see play in almost every deck and would often win the game if top decked at the right time 
just like Called by the Grave is in the TCG these days. That was up until the last time they brought it off the list during the Link era, where the card did see a burst of play due to the novelty of finally being off the ban list, but it's not nearly as omnipresent as it used to be now. The game has just sped up to the point where one free revive isn't enough to completely turn the tides of the duel anymore, and differently from before, it's usually main to get a free bond in the field for combo plays, and not getting a boss monster back from the graveyard. Monster Reborn is still a very good card, but the pace of the game made it much less of a bomb as it once was, and could probably come back to three copies without affecting the meta much, if at all. And coming in at number three, we have Change of Heart. This spell lets you target a monster opponent controls and take control of it until the end phase. Monster stealing cards have been some of the most hated staples in Yu-Gi-Oh's history, and this is no exception. Change of Heart was another one of those cards that were thought to be perpetually banned with no chance of coming back into the game. Many strictly worse retrains of this card received similar treatments with the years. Snatch Steel was released in a similar time to Change of Heart and is still banned to this day, being freed for just a single format in early 2015, where it became such a sacky card it had to be banned again extremely quickly. Brain Control, the first worst Change of Heart, which added a small life point cost and could only take face-up monsters, had to be limited soon into release and would later be banned as well, only coming back after an errata nerfed it into uselessness. Mind Control didn't let you either tribute or attack with a stolen monster, and also it needed to be kept at 1 for most of its lifespan, as it was still consistently great going second card that saw tons of play, especially during toss format when they decided to unrestrict it for a while. With all this said, why is it fine for Change of Heart to exist at 1 then? Well, the quality of going second cards has just gone up tremendously with the years. The cards that actually deal with boards are usually either unrespondable or prevent them from being built up in the first place. Triple Tactics Talents can apply the same effect as Change of Heart without ever targeting, and even that card is not a must include in every deck in the meta. So while this is still a pretty good card if you manage to both draw and resolve it, it's just usually less impactful than other sideboard options you might have. And coming in at number 2, we have Harpy's Feather Duster. Another normal spell, this one destroys all spells and traps your opponent controls. Back row removal has been something that has historically been somewhat restricted due to how most interactions used to be present only in spell and traps, especially during your opponent's turn. Feather Duster is probably the strongest single piece of back row removal ever put into the game, so it's no surprise it stayed banned for ages on end. Mystical Space Typhoon only provides a single pop and it itself was limited for a large part of Yu-Gi-Oh's history. For a very long time, people only had Heavy Storm as a reliable way to clear out all back row at once, which had the downside of popping your own cards as well, and even that had to be banned at some point. Many clunkier kinds of back row removal ended up seeing play throughout the years, such as Dust Tornado, which was just a strictly worse MST, or Full House, which specifically needed to destroy a mix of face up and face downs, and even Malevolent Catastrophe, which needed your opponent to attack to even trigger its effect. However, as time passes and Yu-Gi-Oh sped up, Konami began to release more and more busted ways to remove back row. Cosmic Cyclone and then Twin Twisters were two options that were almost objectively better than MST. Some years later, the TCG would finally be blessed with Lightning Storm, which can wipe away your opponent's entire back row as long as you control no face-up cards. It's in this context that Harpy's Feather Duster was released from the ban list, where it's still a very good option to run, but it's not blatantly overpowered compared to other cards we have to deal with spells and traps. Both Twin Twisters and Cosmic are quick play spells, which give them the ability to set as interactions for your opponent's turn, as well as being good outs to anti-spell fragrance, a popular side deck card. While Lightning Storm can wipe out monsters as well, which is occasionally useful if your opponent isn't playing around it or has ended primarily on Link monsters. But even if it isn't the objectively best card you can run for back row anymore, Feather Duster is still a very popular card to out pesky floodgates, in today's meta anyway, be it in the main or side deck. And at number one, we have Solemn Judgment, the only counter trap card on this list that can negate and destroy the summon of any monster or activation of any spell or trap card for half your life points. Solemn Judgment is a card with a really interesting history. It's always been a quite busted effect to have on a spell speed 3 effect, but it took a while for people to discover it due to how daunting the life point cost sounded at first. Still, whenever people go back to playing those old formats, you will almost always see Solemn Judgment being played the maximum copies available. Being able to negate your opponent's powerful comeback options, their combo enabler, or even their boss monster summon, all on the same card just gave this card utility like no one other. The cost didn't matter if the loss in tempo and card advantage would make your opponent lose the game turns later anyways, and this is what led to Solemn Judgment getting banned. Even Solemn's weaker retrains and Solemn Strike and Solemn Warding were extremely meta-warping, with the later also earning itself a place on limited list for several years. With all this said, if there's one card type that time wasn't kind to, it was trap cards. Solemn Judgment was free from the ban list once again in the Link era, where it was still a powerful control tool, 
but not nearly as overwhelming as it once was. As games are much more likely to be over by turn 2 than ever before, it can become incredibly risky to add cards like this which do nothing when going second to your decks. Nowadays, usually only extremely heavy back row decks are likely to main Solemn Judgment at 3 copies it's available in, and even then it can be risky to play it over other options, as at least Solemn Strike can be comboed with other trap cards such as Torrential Tribute to play into Omni Negates when going second. Still, Solemn Remains is one of the best generic trap cards you can run in your side deck, as it's an amazing way to stop all kinds of busted going second cards that are now in the game, and that even includes several other entries on this list. Despite so many retrains and the abundance of archetypal counter trap negates available these days, Solemn Judgment remains one of the scariest trap cards you can play into the modern metagame. Even when it's a card type that has largely been phased out unless it's activatable from the hand, or a floodgate, Solemn continues to see play and that's why it makes it to the first slot on this list. In this video, we'll go over the best kinds of effects that Yu-Gi-Oh cards can have, and rank them in orders of which are the best of the best, even if there isn't actually a good card which has some of these really good effects. And at number 10, we have the effect of drawing cards. Drawing cards in Yu-Gi-Oh is a lot more valuable than in other card games, because Yu-Gi-Oh does not have a resource system. In things like Magic, Pokemon, or Hearthstone, you have to pay a resource in order to use your cards. And sometimes, some of your cards are part of the resource you need to pay. So in those games, drawing cards is a trade-off of having to both get rid of a card from your hand and give up some of your resources of that game while being able to do less things during your turn. In Yu-Gi-Oh, none of that applies. You don't do anything other than pay the cost the card literally as printed on its card text. If you had a deck of nothing but Pot of Greed that lets you draw two cards for no cost, you could just draw through your entire deck in one turn. And this little niche of Yu-Gi-Oh is why drawing cards is so much harder to do. A card like Pot of Desires, which lets you draw two cards at the cost of getting rid of a fourth of your deck, is considered really good because drawing two cards is just that valuable in this game. It allows you to go plus one in card advantage, and card advantage matters a lot more in a game where card advantage is everything since you can play every card in your deck in one turn if you're able to draw into it. So pretty much every card which allows you to draw effortlessly is banned, and all the ones that aren't banned have incredible restrictions and downsides to them, like banishing a fourth of your deck. And at number 9, we have Quick Effect Monster Destruction. So this one is kind of specific. Being able to destroy monsters is good. Being able to destroy all of your opponent's monsters is even better. But, being able to destroy your opponent's monsters during your opponent's turn on a quick effect from a monster is even better. -er. It might be weird to think that destroying one monster during your opponent's turn is better than destroying all of them during your turn, but it is. That's why cards like Dark Hole, which can destroy all of your opponent's monsters, is currently unlimited, whereas cards like Zodiac Dryden't, which can destroy one monster during your opponent's turn, is banned. The thing with quick effect destruction is that it allows you to disrupt your opponent's strategy. It's more than just destroying that card. As if your opponent is setting up a combo, and you know what that combo is, you can destroy a key combo piece before they get a chance to use it. Or, if your opponent is using something that will counter you, you can get rid of it before it has a chance to counter you. Like destroying a brand new Eater of Millions before it gets a chance to destroy one of your destruction immune cards. Now, destroying your opponent's spell and trap cards is also good during your opponent's turn. However, modern Yu-Gi-Oh is very much about monster effects, so being able to get rid of monsters before they can use their monster effects, or be used to build into stronger monsters, is more valuable than destroying one of your opponent's spell or trap cards during their turn, since you can't really prevent them from doing combos with spell or trap card removal in the same way that you can prevent your opponent from doing combos by destroying monsters. So, having a quick effect destruction of any card is good as well, because it gives you the option to destroy spell or traps as well, but it's really the ability to destroy monsters specifically that's the better effect, and why it makes this list, but only at the number 9 spot. And at number 8, we have Graveyard Effects, or the effect of gaining advantage from the graveyard. Now, there are a handful of cards in the game which have effects that can be activated directly from the graveyard. Usually in response to something happening, like how you're able to set Lost Winds after your opponent's special summons a monster from their extra deck, but some of them can be activated whenever you want, during opportunities in which you can use spell speed 1 effects, so generally during your main phase. 
And then there's graveyard effects that can be used whenever you want during both players' turns, like Orca's cards when their field spell card is out, or certain trap graveyard effects, as most trap cards have a spell speed 2 effect if they're usable from the graveyard. Now, the reason graveyard effects are so valuable is for a whole bunch of reasons. First, it's much easier to send cards from your deck to the graveyard than it is to add them to your hand. Second, if you do have the card in your hand, you can send it to the graveyard to activate the cost of another effect, and then still gain their effects anyway from the graveyard. So it turns a lot of cards which have strong downsides into benefits, as you still get to gain advantage from those resources used. And also it lets you use a card that was once on the field again, as if you normal summon an Orcus monster for example, and then use it to go into a combo piece, you can then use it again from the graveyard to get another combo piece on the board. So, if you do use the card on the field, you can use it again later. Or if your opponent has some kind of strategy where they try to get rid of your hand, it doesn't matter as you can still do your plays from the graveyard. Modern graveyard effects are basically like having a second hand, and gaining free advantage from the graveyard is super good, and why pretty much any kind of card which has a good graveyard effect sees competitive play. And at number 7, we have the Omni Negate. This is the ability to negate anything your opponent has, and is one of the best effects in the game, because, if used at the right time, can completely disrupt your opponent's entire turn. If your opponent is going for a long combo chain in order to make an unbreakable board, there is always one point in that combo where if you negate one of the effects, it stops them dead in their tracks, and makes it easier for you to do combos on your turn. Although conversely, if you're going against a deck that has a whole bunch of negates, then you won't be able to do anything, and your opponent can just slowly poke you to death. Or if you have a strong board and only one negate, there is a good chance you can stop whatever your opponent is trying to use to break your board. Modern Yu-Gi-Oh! is kind of built around negates. Your deck is considered good if you can get out combo pieces and still have enough room in your deck in order to have a couple of negates. If your deck requires too many combo pieces to do anything and can't play enough negates, it probably won't see competitive play. And at number 6, we have the ability to special summon monsters from your deck. If you have the ability to summon a monster, the best possible place to special summon it from is your deck, as that's the default starting position, and requires no resources in order to get to that target. If you special summon a monster from your hand, you still need to get that target to your hand. Or if you special summon it from your graveyard or the banished zone, you need to get it there first. Whereas you don't need to move a card in your deck anywhere, and you just have tons of cards in your deck at all times. So, resource-wise, it's the best possible place to special summon monsters from. And that's why most of the cards that let you special summon from the deck are incredibly strong or banned. Especially if they're graveyard effects that let you special summon from the deck, like Orcist Harp Horror, which is a card that was banned recently for having two of the best effects in the game. I was honestly surprised when I first saw that card printed because the effect was just incredibly good. Currently, we have a card called Destiny Hero Malicious, who can special summon other copies of itself from the deck from the graveyard, and that card is actually super good. I wouldn't be surprised to see it be put back on the semi-limited list in the future, especially since at three copies, it allows you to go plus two in card advantage if you're able to get a single one of them into the graveyard. And at number five, we have the ability to search out spell cards. Generally, spell cards are incredibly difficult to search out, where the only common spell searcher, the left arm offering, requires you to go minus two in card advantage to even use and it still sees tons of competitive play. The ability to search out spell cards is incredibly rare, and generally only attached to cards which can search out specific cards from their archetype, or have convoluted requirements to searching out any spell card. When it comes to the trio of spell, trap, and monster cards, spells are definitely the hardest ones to search out, and have the least amount of support for searching them out, because they have the potential to be the strongest if they can be searched out. One of the reasons Soul Charge stayed unbanned for so long, despite the fact that it was obviously an incredibly powerful card that could win you the game on its own, was because it was difficult to search out. You basically had to get lucky in order to win with it, since it was limited to one copy for most of its lifetime of competitive availability. And it was also why they thought printing a card like That Grass Looks Greener was okay, because it was a generic normal spell card with a powerful effect, just like Soul Charge. But... It was impossible to build your deck around it, since it was so difficult to search out, and 
required you to play a 60 card deck to get the full benefit of it. Although, Left Arm Offering existed and gave them just enough searchability that people were playing 60 card decks in order to make use of that grass looks greener anyway. And if they were able to pull off a single grass, they could go a potential plus 20 off of all of the graveyard effects that they just sent there. And because of that potential to gain so much advantage from one card, they were happily playing Left Arm Offering, which got rid of their entire hand in order to bring out that one card. There are just some spell cards that can give you so much advantage that they can win you the game on their own. And most of the time, those cards get banned, or are so niche and hard to search out that no one plays them, which is why this is one of the best effects in the game. And at number 4, we have Discarding from your opponent's hand. If you're able to discard every card from your opponent's hand during your first turn, then your opponent doesn't really get a chance to play the game, which can basically win you the game in most cases. Unless they're playing a deck that has nothing but graveyard effects. Another reason why graveyard effects are so good. However, most decks only have a handful of cards with graveyard effects, and a lot of them have triggers on how they can be used anyway. So, if you find a way to get rid of every card in your opponent's hand before they have a chance to play the game, there's a good chance you're going to win 9 times out of 10. Currently, the only meta deck that can really pull this off successfully and consistently are Trickstar decks, with their Trickstar Reincarnation and Draw Lockbird combo. But outside of that, usually Konami bans any card which even comes close to allowing you to discard cards from your opponent's hand too easily. Pretty much every single spell or trap card which allows you to discard from your opponent's hand without some kind of insane condition or cost is just straight up banned on the ban list. And any card which allows you to loop an effect to discard your opponent's hand generally gets placed on the ban list immediately, like Wind Up Carriers and Mighty and Topologic Gumblar Dragon. So, if you can prevent your opponent from playing the game before they get a chance to play the game, you don't have to worry about things like card advantage or Omni Negates, which makes it one of the better effects in the game. And at number 3, we have the ability to cheat monsters out of the extra deck. Now, the best place to special summon monsters from is the deck, but it's even better to special summon a monster from the extra deck, because there's a lot of really good extra deck monsters who are balanced around the fact that you can only bring them out through some resource-intensive combo. So, if you're able to cheat out a card like Hot Red Dragon Archifine Abyss, you get a strong monster from the field who has a good negate effect, who was made to be strong because he's supposed to be difficult to bring out, as its requirements are a specific type of synchro monster as one of its materials. Now, some extra deck monsters had the foresight to prevent them from being cheated out of the extra deck, so you're kind of limited in which cards you can actually pull out, depending on which effects you're trying to use. If you're using a card like Waking the Dragon, which lets you special summon any monster from your extra deck, generally the best choice is Ultimate Falcon, because of a whole bunch of different factors like which decks you'll be going up against in the meta, and the average time in which the card will be brought out, i.e. usually during your opponent's turn when they destroy this card, although there's even some stuff like Naturia Exterio, which has the effect to negate spell or trap cards pretty easily. There's even cards who have floating effects that activate if they're sent directly from the extra deck to the graveyard, like Elder Entity Natis or Herald of the Arc Light. Even cards which can only cheat out an incredibly specific type of extra deck monster, like Instant Fusion for example, sees tons of competitive play because of how good so many extra deck monsters are. They're not balanced around being able to be brought out easily. They're balanced around being difficult to get out. So being able to cheat out some cards, which are intended to be very hard to bring out, is what gives this effect so much power. And why out of all of the Gar Dragons, only Gar Dragon Agarpain got banned, since it special summons from the extra deck, while the other two get special summon from the deck and graveyard. Special summoning from the deck and graveyard are both really good too, it's just cheating monsters out of the extra deck is better. Considering most decks are all about going into a whole bunch of combos for the sole purpose of going into extra deck monsters. If you could just cheat them all out, then that would kind of eliminate the need for most combo decks. And at number 2, we have the ability to activate trap cards from your hand. Now, trap cards are balanced around the fact that they need to be set for a turn before you can activate them. That's why a card like Jar of Greed is unlimited and can be played at 3 copies per deck and sees absolutely zero competitive play. While cards like Upstart Goblin and Into the Void, two cards with the same exact effect of just drawing one card, except they have downsides to draw in a card, are limited on the ban list and can only be played at one copy per deck. 
Being able to activate a card the turn you draw it is just infinitely more valuable than having to set it and wait a turn, as it allows all kinds of combo plays to happen, and that's why searching out spell cards is better than searching out the other two types of cards. Now, there are only a handful of cards that allow you to activate trap cards from your hand, and nearly all of them are limited to a certain archetype, or have all kinds of restrictions on how you're able to do it. Like Bubble Illusion, for example, requires you to control a bubble man on your side of the field, and activate this specific card in order to just activate one trap card from your hand. Ebon High Magician requires you to detach an Exceeds material to activate one trap card from your hand, and this only works during your opponent's turn. Trap Tricks Atrax allows you to activate whole normal trap cards from your hand, and so on and so on. None of them have blanket activate anything from your hand though, because there was two cards kind of like that. Makura the Destructor and Temple of the Kings. Both of these cards got banned for having an unlimited use of trap cards from your hand. Temple of the Kings allowed you to activate set trap cards the turn they were set, so it was not as strong as Makura, but even that was so ridiculously overpowered that was banned for years and only came off the ban list because they changed its effect to only allow you to activate one trap card the turn it's set per turn, instead of an unlimited amount of them. And Makura the Destructor allows you to activate any trap cards the turn this card is sent to the graveyard, which opens up so many different kinds of broken loops and combos that the card can never be unbanned. Unless they gave it a one limit like they did with Temple of the Kings. Because with Makura the Destructor, you can easily draw through every single card in your deck, or attack with an infinite amount of damage, or inflict 8,000 points of effect damage to your opponent in one turn easily, or just mill your opponent's entire deck, or activate your counter trap cards from your hand to negate things instantly, turning a card like Wiretap into a red reboot for example. Being able to activate trap cards from your hand is so strong that trap cards who have the inherent effect that allow them to activate themselves from the hand are generally the only ones that see competitive play. Although this effect does kind of break the rules of the game a little bit, which is why it gets such a high spot on this list. And at number one, we have the ability to instantly win. If there was a card that had the ability that just says you instantly win the duel when you use this, obviously everyone would play that. There is a card kind of like that, called Exodia, but you need to have all five pieces of that card in your hand in order to activate that effect. And that's why Exodia decks have seen play on and off pretty much ever since the inception of the game. And that's also why in other card games, they call strategies that allow you to win instantly Exodia decks. Yu-Gi-Oh! actually does have quite a bit of cards that let you win instantly, but the one that's actually good is banned, and the other few that are also good, but not as broken as last turn, are limited to one copy to make them less consistent. And besides last turn, the Exodia cards and Final Countdown, all of the other instant winner cards are pretty much terrible. And that's kind of the point. It's just like the skip your opponent's turn effect. They do have the effect in the game, it's just such an incredibly powerful effect that it's real easy to accidentally make it completely broken, like they did with last turn, and how you could instantly win if you just brought out a monster that prevented your opponent from special summoning. Or with things like Final Countdown, where if your entire deck was just nothing but cost-effective stall cards, you could essentially always win as long as you were able to survive for 10 turns. And Exodia decks are why they limit draw cards so heavily. To an extent, if there's ever too much good draw power, there's always a chance that Exodia decks will become top tier. So they generally give draw cards some kind of downside where they mess with the main deck, like Pot of Desires, banishing a fourth of your deck in order to draw cards, or how the dangers randomly discard cards from your hand in order to draw cards. They're very scared of instant win effects and have to design a lot of things around the ones that already exist in the game, because Exodia is too iconic to ban. And drawing cards is already a super powerful effect anyway, so no one really bats an eye when a new draw card is released that doesn't work with Exodia decks very well. And that's also why one of the strongest decks in the game, if you're able to use banned cards, is just one that lets you draw every single card in your deck. Basically because it would let you draw into Exodia easily. In this video we'll be going over cards that are annoying to use for players for any number of reasons that don't really have to do with the activation requirement, but that could be part of it. And at number 10, we have Mystical Ref Panel. This card is annoying to use in the sense that you kind of have to look up online to see what it actually does. 
I can't think of a card which has a longer list of examples as Mystical Rough Panel. Because what it does is, when a spell card is activated that targets a player, the effect of that spell card is applied to the other player instead. The problem being, most cards that target players don't say that they target them. Like Pot of Greed, for example, because they don't really need to. So in order to figure out which cards do target the player and which ones don't, the best way to figure that out is if it has an effect that doesn't target something specifically, and instead affects you in some way. Like, if you want to activate Pot of Generosity, that affects your hand, but not really specific cards, so Mystical Ref Panel will allow you to reverse the effect on your opponent in order to make them return two cards from their hand back to their deck. If you use it with Cold Feet, which makes it so you can't activate spell or trap cards this turn, nor set any of them, it doesn't target any specific cards, just what you can do with them so it can be reflected on your opponent. If you activate the card, Cards from the Sky, which requires you to banish a light fairy-type monster from your hand to draw two cards, you cannot reflect this to your opponent because it has specific conditions that your opponent might not be able to fulfill. But if your opponent can fulfill them, you still can't use it anyway. Although this one might be because it requires you to target a specific card in order to use the effect. If your opponent activates the card Triple Tactical Talents, in order to use its effect to either look at your hand and shuffle one card back into the deck, or to draw two cards, you can use Mystical Rough Panel in response in order to reverse that on your opponent or draw two cards yourself. But, if your opponent activates Triple Tactical Talent in order to steal one of your monsters, then you cannot use Mystical Rough Panel to reflect that effect. So, if you just go into using Mystical Rough Panel in order to reflect only bad effects onto your opponent, there's not much to remember. The hard part of it is knowing which cards you can steal from your opponent. Like if they try to use Pot of Duality, for example. And at number 9, we have Reversal Quits. This is a spell card which has the effect where you can send all cards in your hand on your side of the field to the graveyard and then call a type of card from the top of your deck. And if you call it correctly, you get to exchange your current life points with your opponents. Now, the difficulty with this card is twofold. One of them is getting your life points down below 500. The other is properly stacking the top card of your deck so that you can declare the type correctly. This was kind of the basics for the Reversal Quiz OTK deck, which was a legit meta deck in the past. What they would do is just use cards in order to lower their life points below 500. That way, when they activate Reversal Quiz, the condition where you have to send all your cards to the graveyard would send either Black Pendant or Fuma Shuriken to the graveyard, which would then inflict 500 or 700 points damage to your opponent after the effect Reversal Quiz resolves, resulting in that last bit of necessary damage in order to win. And Konami actually heavily restricts cards that allows you to spend too much life points too quickly, like Wall of Revealing Light or Inspection. Wall of Revealing Light is a continuous trap card, which allows you to pay as much life points as you want in multiples of 1,000 in order to make it so your opponent cannot attack if they have an attack less than the amount of life points paid. And since this card basically allows you to pay 7,000 life points in one turn, it's limited to one copy because it makes it too easy to use cards like Reversal Quits. Inspection has a similar story. This is a continuous spell card which allows you to pay 500 life points during your opponent's standby phase in order to look at one random card in their hand. This card does not have a once per turn on it, so Konami added a ruling where you can only use it once per turn without bothering to errata the card to reflect this change, which is one of the few cards in the game that was given a once per turn due to a ruling and not an errata. So, you have to properly get your life points below 500 through normal means without spending too much life points to accidentally OTK yourself. Then you have to set the top card of your deck with something else, which could be accomplished by just using a Feather of the Phoenix. So overall, not the hardest thing in the world to do. The top five spots in this list are way harder than the bottom five, but still, a lot of things you have to keep track of in order to pull off the win, rather than just simply fulfilling the activations of the card. And at number eight, we have Berserker Soul. Now, this is only on this list for being able to use to its maximum potential, as what this card does, is if a monster you control inflicts 1500 or less damage to your opponent by a direct attack, you can then activate this card by discarding your entire hand. Then you get to excavate the top card of your deck and send it to the graveyard and inflict 500 damage to your opponent. Then you get to repeat this up to 7 more times until you excavate a non-monster card. So, if you're able to excavate 8 monster cards in a row, that's 4000 points of damage, which makes this one of the highest amount of burn damage cards in the game. However, Manually setting up the top 8 cards of your deck to be all monsters is incredibly difficult to pull off. Unless you're playing a full monster mash deck, like Super Heavy Samurais, or Gallus the Star Beast Engine. Although outside of a full monster mash deck, 
trying to stack the top 8 cards of your deck in order to pull off this effect is almost impossible. Most cards that let you stack the top of your deck don't go that far. And it also means you can't play more than one copy of Berserker Soul if you're trying to go full Monster Mash for the easier activation requirement. And at number 7, we have Dual Taining. This is a field spell card which has the effect of drawing two cards during a turn that a player is able to activate one of its five conditions. Where you either special summon five monsters with different levels at the same time, one monster battles five times, you activate a card effect as a chain link five or higher, roll a six-sided dice or toss a coin five times, or take damage that makes their life points 500 or less. Basically, fulfilling the conditions for any of these is pretty difficult to pull off. You basically have to build your deck around being able to pull off a single one of its conditions. And you can only really lock into its last condition of just taking damage that makes your life points less than 500. In fact, it's such a pain to set up any of these conditions that the card doesn't see any competitive play. Despite the fact that drawing two cards is an excellent effect. And at number 6, we have Spirit Sculptor. This is a card which has the effect that you contribute one monster to add a monster from your deck to your hand, whose combined original attack and defense equals to the combined attack and defense of the tributed monster. So the effect itself is pretty straightforward. Tribute a card to add another monster from your deck to your hand. The thing that makes this card hard to use is the math involved. You have to consider the attack and defense values of all the cards in your deck in relation to the cards you have on the field. Spirit Sculptor itself has 1600 attack and 2100 defense, which when added together equals 3700. Which means Spirit Sculptor can tribute itself in order to search out another card which equals 3700 in value. Like Toon Dark Magician, who has 2000 attack and 1700 defense, which adds up to 3700 in value. So Spirit Sculptor exists as a card that can search out pretty much anything from your deck, and he can just tribute himself in order to search out anything which has 3700 in value with their attack and defense. Although it doesn't have to tribute itself, but you do have to do a lot of math on the fly if you're trying to use this thing in order to search out other cards that you haven't predetermined the math values before the duel started. It's another one of those like Mystical Ref Panel, where you kind of have to memorize a lot of things before the duel starts. And these are the kinds of cards that this list is really all about. Not ones that have difficult activation requirements like dual taining, but ones that you don't want to use because you don't want to do math or keep track of too many things. And at number 5, we have Ma'at. This is a monster which can only be special summoned from your hand by sending specifically a light dragon type monster and a light fairy type monster you control to the graveyard and cannot be special summoned in other ways. Then it goes on to have the effect where once per turn you can declare three card names and then look at the top three cards of your deck. And if any of those cards are of the three you declared, you get to add them to your hand. And this card gains attack and defense equal to the amount of cards you added to your hand times 1000. Now, I think this card wins the contest of cards which require you to declare the most amount of exact names without loops. As I'm pretty sure most cards that make you declare card names don't require you to do more than one. So, the difficulty in this card is kind of like Reversal Quiz. First off, it's hard to actually bring the card out because it requires ridiculously specific materials and a monster card you have to search out and add to your hand in order to use it. It's kind of like Neo's Wise Man levels of hard to summon. And then in order to make best use of it, the fact that you have to find a way to stack or just look at the top cards of your deck so that you can pull off the effect. And then of course, it's just as easy as naming the top three cards of your deck, which just requires a little bit of brain power of having to remember the three cards after you've looked at them, or typing them in a lot if you're trying to resolve this effect on an online simulator. And at number four, we have Mischief of the Time Goddess. This card's effect is actually pretty simple. You can only activate this at the end of a battle phase as a chain link one, and only if you control Valkyrie monsters, where you then get to skip to the start of the battle phase of your next turn. So basically it gives you two battle phases, but only for one specific archetype. So of course they would design that archetype in a way where it wouldn't be too broken being able to attack twice. Although this is still a pretty beneficial effect to have. Now, where this card runs into some difficulty is in all of the ruling nightmares skipping to the start of the battle phase causes. If you have an effect which activates during the end phase of the turn you use it, you just kind of skip that and have to individually deal with the consequences of skipping those things. For example, if you use something like World Legacy Clash, which allows you to banish a face up monster you control until the end phase in order to lower the attack and defense of a monster your opponent controls, buy that card's attack and defense. Normally, the card would return during the end phase, but with Mischief of the Time Goddess, the card would never return because it skips the end phase in which it would normally return on. If you have Swords of Revealing Light on the field, and it would become your opponent's third end phase, 
since the end phase is skipped, Swords of Revealing Light will just sort of stay on the field forever, because it missed the turn in which it would destroy itself. This is just another one of those cards like Mystical Rough Panel, where the effect itself is simple enough, you just have to remember a whole bunch of rulings with cards you control, and might run into some problems when it comes to your opponent's cards and how they resolve when their phases are skipped. And at number 3, we have a Slash Draw. This is a card which has the effect that you have to discard one card to activate it, then you get to send a number of cards from the top of your deck to the graveyard, equal to the number of cards your opponent controls. Then afterwards you draw one card and show it to your opponent. If that one card you drew is another copy of Slash Draw, then you get to destroy as many cards in the field as possible and inflict 2,000 points of damage to your opponent for each card destroyed this way. So, if you simply have four cards on the field, that's an OTK. Or an FTK when this card was still usable in the meta. Because people were actually able to pull off this effect pretty consistently. And the way they stopped that was by limiting it to one, so you couldn't actually use the effect to inflict all of that damage. Although, this card wasn't really supposed to be resolvable consistently, because of the random nature of how hard it is to actually draw another copy of Slash Draw with the effect. So, how were people actually able to pull this off? Well, with the Danger Skulldread decks. They would use the Danger Engine in order to draw nearly every card in their deck in one turn, then use Asaryuja Skulldread's number 4 effect, which reads, if this card is Link Summoned using 4 materials, you get to draw 4 cards and then place 3 cards from your hand on the bottom of your deck in any order. So what Danger players would do is just keep using the effect in order to stack the bottom of their deck. And then when they drew cards towards the bottom of their deck, they would reliably know which cards were there already. That way, when they got close to the bottom of the deck, they knew when to use a copy of Slash Draw in their hand, based on the number of cards in their opponent's field, while having at least 4 cards on the field to destroy and send to the graveyard. So, if all of that sounds confusing, that's because it was. This was a pretty difficult FTK to pull off because it required you to remember the position of the cards at the bottom of your deck. And you're not allowed to check your deck to remember where you place that slash draw. This card really embodies what this list is all about. The conditions to use this card aren't really that difficult. It's just it requires a lot of brain power in order to constantly remember the position of slash draw on your deck when you're placing more and more cards at the bottom of your deck. Not an impossible card to pull off by any means, but it definitely isn't as easy to use as other cards in the game. And at number 2, we have Card of the Soul. This is a normal spell card, which allows you to add basically any monster from your deck to your hand, just as long as the monster you're adding to your hand has an attack and defense, which adds up to equal your current life points. So if you use this on your first turn with 8,000 life points, you can use it to search out Obelisk the Tormentor, for example, since that card has 4,000 attack and defense, which adds up to 8,000. So, that's a pretty simple effect, kind of similar to Spirit Sculptor even. What makes this card difficult to use though, is as soon as you start losing any amount of life points. You see, using this card on your first turn is easy, you can just use it to search out things like Obelisk or Haman, Lord of Striking Thunder. But what happens if you get attacked by a monster and you lose 1800 life points for example? This would leave you with 6200, and then you would just have to do mental math to figure out which cards you can actually search out. Because based on the rules of Yu-Gi-Oh, you can't actually activate a card unless you can resolve the effect. Which means you can't just use Card of Soul to look at your deck to do the math and then say, oh, never mind, I can't find anything, and then shuffle it afterwards. You have to know for sure that you can resolve the effect in order to use it at all. And since it's so difficult to know the total values of all the monsters in your deck, you could either just memorize the attack and defense sums of every card you have, or just never use it after you lose any amount of life points which is what most people do when they actually use the card. In the normal TCG, it doesn't really see any competitive play, but in Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links, where the starting life point value is only 4,000, this card comes up a lot more often, because it's a lot easier to search out a card which adds up to 4,000 than it is one that adds up to 8,000. And at number 1, we have a Linear Equation Cannon. Now, a lot of the cards on this list require you to do a lot of mental math, but I think this is the only card in the game which literally is an algebra equation in Yu-Gi-Oh! card form. This card has the effect that during the battle phase, you can activate this card in order to declare a whole number from 1 to 6. Then, choose one effect monster your opponent controls that has a level. Then, multiply the level of the monster you chose by your declared number. Then, you count the number of cards your opponent controls and add that to the total value. Then, check to see if that number equals the number of cards you have in your graveyard. Then, depending on if that answer is yes or no, you get to activate one of its two effects. If yes, and that total number equals the amount of cards in your graveyard, you get to send a number of cards from the top of your deck to the graveyard up to the declared number. 
Then shuffle a number of cards your opponent controls into the deck up to the number of cards sent to the graveyard. And this form of removal is really good because it doesn't target and spins all the cards. Basically, one of the best board wipes you can accomplish. However, if no, you lose life points equal to the declared number times 500. So it could be a good way to instantly lose 3,000 life points if you're trying to lower your life points on purpose. So, since this card allows you to declare a number from 1 to 6, it does allow you to reliably pull off the yes effect, as long as you're able to do the math in your head really quickly and consistently, in order to determine which number from 1 to 6 would allow you to equal the total number of cards in your graveyard in order to spin your opponent's cards, while also having a large enough graveyard to spin more than one card. And there's definitely no other card in the game which requires you to do as much math as this card. At least with things like Heart of the Soul or Spirit Sculptor, you can just do the math before the duel starts and then just never have to worry about it again. But with Linear Equation Canon, resolving a math problem is literally required when trying to use the effect at all. Excluding the amount of times you have to do the equation in your head in order to see if you can even get a yes effect. Which is why Linear Equation Canon easily makes number one spot on this list of cards that are annoying to use. Because it was never about which ones have the toughest summoning conditions, but in the more loose term that you don't want to use Linear Equation Canon because it's difficult to use in a physical sense because, you know, of all the math. A lot of the times I'll see comments from new players asking about particular cards and why they don't see very much play. So in this list, we're going to go over 10 cards that seem really good at first glance to newer players, but don't really see much competitive play for various reasons. And at number 10, we have the Five-Headed Dragon. This is a fusion monster with 5,000 attack and defense, the highest attack point value in the game that a monster can have, and simply requires any five monsters as its materials, and can't be destroyed by battle with certain attributes of monsters, with the restriction where this card must be fusion summoned. Now, I'm sure most people realize why this card isn't very good immediately, and it's not too hard to see why this card doesn't see competitive play. It requires five monsters as materials, and its effects on field aren't really that impressive, or having battle immunity for certain types of monsters isn't super useful on a monster with 5,000 attack. However, you may be quick to mention cards like Future Fusion and Dragon's Mirror, which will allow you to bring out the card much easier. Future Fusion allows you to fusion summon a monster using cards from your deck and could potentially allow you to send any five dragons from your deck to the graveyard. However, Future Fusion received an errata where it won't actually send any cards from your deck to the graveyard until the following turn after you activate it, giving your opponent a full turn to destroy the card, which is pretty easy to do in the modern meta. But pre-errata, Future Fusion used to send the cards immediately from your deck to the graveyard, and that's why the card was banned, because that was actually very good. Especially if combo with something like Five-Headed Dragon to get a whole bunch of graveyard dragon effects set up. There's also Dragon's Mirror that allows you to banish five dragons from your graveyard to bring it out. The thing is, it's actually kind of difficult to set up five materials in your graveyard, and if you're going through the effort to set up so many monsters, usually there should be a better payoff than a 5,000 vanilla beat stick. There is also the option of using Greater Polymerization, which will grant it immunity to destruction effects and piercing damage, since it's a fusion monster that requires more than three materials. Although Greater Polymerization requires you to use monsters from your hand or field, so it's inherently a minus five in card advantage to bring out five-headed dragon. And that is definitely not worth the effort for just adding destruction immunity on top of it. Although it can be fun in a gimmick deck. And at number nine, we have everybody's favorite ritual monster, the Blue Eyes Chaos Max Dragon. Now, this card did actually see some competitive play, Although that was definitely in the past, and some of the other cards on this list saw some competitive play in the past as well, but they're definitely way past their prime. This is a 4,000 attack ritual monster, which has the effect where it can't be targeted or destroyed by card effects, and if it attacks a defense boosted monster, it deals double piercing battle damage. So, if you give your opponent a zero defense monster with creature swap, you can deal 8,000 points of damage if you attack into it with your Blue Eyes Chaos Max Dragon. So, having destruction and target immunity is a good form of protection. And having 4,000 attack makes it unlikely to be destroyed by battle very easily. However, it's not that difficult for the average meta deck to actually out Max Dragon, as two very common extra deck monsters are able to just beat it in battle no problem. The thing is though, if Chaos Max Dragon was just a little bit easier to bring out, it wouldn't be half bad, because the card is pretty decent. One of the main things holding Blue Eyes Chaos Max Dragon back is that its Ritual Spell card does not mention its name specifically. Chaos Form has the ability to Ritual Summon this card by tributing monsters from your hand or field, or it allows you to banish a Blue Eyes White Dragon from your graveyard in order to Ritual Summon Blue Eyes Chaos Max Dragon from your hand. But, Chaos Form does not specifically mention Blue Eyes Chaos Max Dragon in its text, and simply says it can be used to Ritual Summon any Chaos or Blackluster Soldier Ritual Monster. 
And this is the distinction that matters, because one of the best singular pieces of ritual support is pre-preparation of rites. This card has the effect to add a ritual spell and a ritual monster from your deck to your hand, just as long as the ritual's monster's name is specifically listed in that ritual spell card. So it's a straight plus one in card advantage, in one of the best ways possible of allowing you to search those specific cards from your deck. And because Pre-Preparation Rites is so good, it kind of gives a boost to any ritual monsters that are specifically listed in their good ritual spell cards. Although, just not being a Pre-Preparation of Rites target isn't the worst thing in the world. It's the fact that it also has a very high attack point value of 4,000. You see, they also released a whole archetype of support for ritual monsters called the Drytrons. And they have one of the best ritual spell cards in the game called Meteonis Drytron, which allows you to ritual summon a ritual monster from either your hand or graveyard, by tributing machine-type monsters from your hand or field, whose total attacks equal or exceed the ritual monster you're trying to bring out. And because it uses attack point values instead of levels, Meteonis allows you to cheat out some very powerful ritual monsters like Herald of Ultimateness, and a whole bunch of other ritual monsters, but you'll always have to use two cards if you want to bring out Blue Eyes Chaos Max Dragon, because it has 4,000 attack baseline. Now, it's not impossible to use the Drytron. The Drytron ritual monsters themselves have 4,000 attack even, but they're also better to use than Blue Eyes Chaos Max Dragon if you're going to go to the effort of using two Drytrons to go into them. So because of a combination of having a bad ritual spell card that doesn't list its name specifically and having too high of an attack point value, it doesn't gel very well with modern ritual support. And rituals are so inherently bad that they need to be almost broken in order to see competitive play, which Blue Eyes Chaos Max Dragon is not broken enough to reach that threshold, especially not in the modern meta. And at number 8, we have the Winged Dragon of Ra. This is one of the few monsters in the game that has the Divine Beast type and Divine Attribute, and it was a very popular overpowered card in the anime, which has an effect which seems like it's pretty good. It requires three monsters for its Tribute Summon, your opponent can't negate the Tribute Summon, and when it's summoned, you pay life points and you only have 100 left in order to give this card attack and defense equal to the amount of life points you paid. And lastly, you can pay 1,000 life points to destroy one monster on the field on an effect that's not once per turn. So if you have a full 8,000 life points and you bring out the Winged Dragon Raw, it will have 7,900 attack and defense, which is definitely enough to beat over pretty much any monster in the game. So, here's the problem with this card. Outside of its summon not being able to be negated, it has absolutely zero protection. If your opponent activates something like Infinite Impermanence on your Winged Dragon Raw, its attack will be reset down to zero and you don't gain your life points back, so you're just stuck at 100. Also, you can only pay multiples so that you have 100 left, and not just any amount of life points you want. So summoning the card and using the effect is always going to put you in a very risky position, unless you just don't use the effect to gain any attack points. And if you do use the effect to gain attack points, you can't use its other effect to destroy monsters because you won't have any life points left. So if your opponent just has any form of disruption at all, they can easily target the Winged Dragon of Raw and get rid of it, since just lightly breathing on the card will reset its attack point value or get rid of it. And since it requires so many resources to hit the field in the first place, it's usually a good idea to just save your forms of disruption for when the Winged Dragon Raw comes out. In fact, the card was so bad that they released six support cards which exist solely to give it some of its effects back from the anime, which would actually make the monster more useful. And in at number 7, we have Chainsaw Insect. This is a level 4 monster with 2400 attack, which has the effect where at the end of the damage step of this card battled, your opponent draws a card. Now, 2400 attack on a level 4 monster is really high. That's one of the highest values of a level 4 monster in the game. So if you get Chainsaw Insect on the field, chances are you'll be able to beat over any of your opponent's level 4 or lower monsters, and even a lot of their other normal low attack boss monsters. And the cost for this is just your opponent drawing one card, so you can attack with it all you want without having to worry about too much of the downside. The problem though, is that giving your opponent card draw is one of the worst effects in the game, because card advantage in Yu-Gi-Oh! is everything. In other card games, they usually have a resource system which will inherently limit how many actions you're able to perform in a turn. So cards that allow you to draw other cards in other card games are usually not that big a deal, even if the effects are still definitely good nonetheless. In Yu-Gi-Oh! though, a single card draw is so good, that we have cards like Chicken Game banned because they allow you to draw a single card and can be used too easily. A singular card in Yu-Gi-Oh can kind of win you the game on its own because of all of the combos it can allow you to perform, or just because there's a lot of super powerful singular cards in the game. So giving your opponent any kind of card draw better be worth that effect. There's a card called Dark Bribe, which allows you to negate any spell or trap card at the cost of giving your opponent a plus one draw, and that card is considered not very good and only played in very niche situations like Mystic Mind stall decks, and even then, it isn't considered that great of an option compared to other alternatives. 
So having a monster with the same detriments is obviously even worse, because your opponent can proc the effect by attacking into it as well, which is definitely worth it because of how valuable that card draw is. And at number 6, we have Dances with Beasts. This is a trap card which has the effect where if an opponent declares a direct attack, while the combined attack of all face-up monsters they control is 8,000 or higher, you can summon three monsters with different original names. One from your deck, one from your hand, and one from your graveyard. So, being able to get out a card from your deck and graveyard out of those three is really good, especially since it's completely unconditional on what your targets are. If one of your targets is something like Thunderclap Skywolf, it can use its effect on your opponent's turn to destroy all of your opponent's monsters. And modern Yu-Gi-Oh! is all about accumulating a huge board of monsters that can easily have over 8,000 attack. So the effect will probably be live more often than you'd think. However, the big problem with the card is the fact that it's a battle trap, whose trigger is a direct attack and not an attack on one of your monsters. There's another card in the game called Drowning Mirror Force, which can only be activated when your opponent declares a direct attack as well, and it shuffles all of your opponent's monsters back into the deck. And the effect of returning monsters back to the deck is one of the strongest forms of removal in Yu-Gi-Oh!, because it prevents a lot of floating effects. And Drowning Mirror Force sees almost no play in modern Yu-Gi-Oh!, although it is heavily played in Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links. Dances with Beast has an even harsher restriction of also requiring your opponent to control a lot of high attack monsters. And the reason these effects are not very good is because modern Yu-Gi-Oh! is about destroying your opponent's board before entering the battle phase at all. So basically any battle trap, no matter how good it is, is just a sitting duck for your opponent's destruction effects. And that's why cards like Torrential Tribute are a lot more valuable, because they can be activated outside of the battle phase and during the process of your opponent establishing their board, which would be able to destroy your back row. And at number 5, we have Shard of Greed. This is a continuous spell card which has the effect where each time you draw a card for your normal draw phase, you get to place one Greed Counter on this card. Then, once this card has two or more Greed Counters, you can send it to the graveyard to draw two cards. So the card is basically Pot of Greed that takes two turns in order to activate. And Pot of Greed is one of the best singular cards in the game because it just gives you an effortless plus one. And as I've talked about in the Chainsaw Insect section, being able to draw cards in Yu-Gi-Oh! is very good compared to other card games. So having a generic draw two card that just takes two turns to activate sounds like a no-brainer good card. The problem, though, is the same problem as the previous card, in that modern Yu-Gi-Oh! is all about destroying your opponent's board before entering the battle phase, and Shard of Greed is basically a sitting target waiting to get destroyed by basically anything. It's just too vulnerable and doesn't offer you the immediate advantage that would be necessary in order to be played in a combo deck that might want generic card draw. If you're playing an incredibly slow control deck, you also kind of want your effects to do something immediately, because you're playing against your opponent's combo deck that's trying to destroy all your cards. So control decks definitely value cards that are able to stop their opponent's plays, and not cards that take up one of their card draws and waits two turns before being useful. So it's not really useful in combo decks since they need to be able to use everything immediately, or control decks that are trying to survive against combo decks destroying their field. And at number 4, we have Witch's Strike. Witch's Strike is a trap card which has the effect that it can only be activated in response to your opponent negating either the summon of one of your monsters, or the activation of one of your cards or effects. In which case you gain the effect to destroy all cards your opponent controls and in their hand. So basically, if you activate the effect, you gain so much advantage from the destruction that you've basically won the game. Being able to destroy all cards on your opponent's side of the field is pretty good, being able to do that in addition to their hand is even better. Because there aren't really cards in the game that can just get rid of your opponent's entire hand. That is like the rarest effect in Yu-Gi-Oh! and also just one of the strongest. And since the modern metagame is all about negating your cards anyway, wouldn't it seem like this card is kind of overpowered? Well, the problem with this card, and why it doesn't work very well, is mainly tied to the fact that it's a trap card. You see, since this card is a trap card, it's not usable on your first turn, or going second, which is usually when the most amount of negates are happening. So this card is something that would be very good during your first turn, which is not usable until your next turn, which immediately takes it out of the running for a lot of decks. Because if you want your combos to go off uninterrupted, you basically have to wait a whole turn before being able to set Witch's Strike if you want to use it in retaliation for something getting negated, in which case you're probably going to lose by that point since you didn't actually do anything. If you're just setting it because you play a whole bunch of control trap cards in the first place, chances are you're trying to stop your opponent from getting out monsters which can negate, or you're playing a whole bunch of floodgates, where you don't really get your stuff negated in the first place. And there are a lot of modern cards which don't negate activations, simply the effects of cards. Two of the most popular hand traps in the game are Ash Blossom and Joy Spring and Infinite Impermanence, and neither of the negates from these cards can activate Witch's Strike, since they don't specifically negate the activation of a card, they negate the effects, which is a difference that matters. 
Ash Blossom and Joyous Spring won't proc Witch's Strike, but Ghost Spell and Haunted Mansion will because it does negate the activation. Sword Soul Master will not proc the effect of Witch's Strike, but Barone will. So it's kind of an awkward card to use because there's lots of negates in the game which don't actually negate the activation of cards and only their effects. So realistically, even having the option of activating Witch's Strike itself is kind of hard, as most of the time, if your opponent is able to get up a board of negates, they'll probably have at least one other negate to then negate the effect of Witch's Strike, since it's just a normal trap card which happens after the negate takes place and not during the chain. So if Witch's Strike was a quick play spell card, it would actually be really good. The fact that you had to wait a turn in order to maybe use it means it's not likely to be resolved outside of very specific types of decks, just because of how important the first couple of turns are, and how bad trap cards are which have incredibly specific triggers, since they're usually so vulnerable to being destroyed by your opponent's destruction effects. However, if you do resolve the effect, you probably win. So it's a nice gimmick with a situational effect that comes up a lot more often than other gimmicky cards, to the point where it might see competitive play someday, depending on certain specific trap synergies or support that might be released in the future. And at number three, we have Mirror Force. This is a trap card which can only be activated when your opponent declares an attack, where you then get to destroy all attack vision monsters your opponent controls. Now, there is a card in the game called Lightning Storm, which has an effect that can only be activated if you control no face-up cards, it allows you to either destroy all face-up attack position monsters your opponent controls, or destroy all spell and trap cards your opponent controls. And Lightning Storm is an absolute staple card that sees all kinds of competitive play in both the main and side deck, whereas Mirror Force does not, despite sharing the same effect of being able to destroy all your opponent's attack position monsters. And the reason for that is because it's a trap card which can only be activated during the battle phase from a specific trigger by your opponent. And the same reason Witch's Strike and Dances with Beasts is not very good kind of applies to Mirror Force, in that trap cards kind of have to be usable whenever in order to see competitive play, and most of the time even then they're too slow and they need to be usable from the hand immediately if they're going to actually see widespread competitive play. And because, as I mentioned earlier, the metagame is more about destroying your opponent's board before attacking rather than building up a huge board and then attacking. Usually a deck won't enter the battle phase until after they've already destroyed all your opponent's cards. So Mirror Force is just way too vulnerable to survive to the battle phase, even though the effect is technically good. The effect of Mirror Force does have a history of competitive play, but not really in the modern game. The power level of Mirror Force is probably a little bit higher than the rest of the cards on this list, but it's definitely a new player trap that seems a lot better than it really is. Although I can't really think of a better new player trap than the next two cards on this list. And at number two, we have Magic Cylinder. This is another battle trap which can only be activated when your opponent declares an attack, just like Mirror Force, except its effect is that it simply negates the attack of the monster, then inflicts damage to your opponent equal to that monster's attack. So, if your opponent is attacking with something like a number 100 Numeron Dragon that has 9000 attack, then you can reflect all of that damage back to your opponent and win the game. Or if your opponent is attacking with some other big attacking monster and they're low on life points, this can kind of steal you the game with the massive amount of effect damage it deals. Although, here's why this card isn't very good. This situation, and when this card can single-handedly win you the game, are incredibly situational and niche at best, and not really worth playing a main deck card for. So in all other situations, and normal situations, monsters will not have more than 8,000 attack. And all you're doing in those normal situations is stopping a single attack by going minus one in card advantage, and while having a vulnerable battle trap on the field the whole time. Dealing damage to your opponent's life points is not really worth anything, unless that's the whole point of your deck. And even most burn decks don't play Magic Cylinder because it's too reliant on your opponent performing an action, and they'd rather play other burn cards that can be chained immediately to your opponent trying to clear your back row. And being able to stop a singular attack is also not a good effect, unless you're able to do it incidentally through some other amazing effect. Because even using a card to stop an entire battle phase like Threatening Roar is not worth playing unless the point of your deck is trying to stall out. And even Threatening Roar isn't considered a very good card anymore. Same with Scrap Iron Scarecrow, which can stop one attack every turn while not losing any card advantage. And that's mainly the problem with Magic Cylinder. It's too hard to trigger because it has to survive to the battle phase, and both of its effects are not really worth playing the card, since there are other better ways to deal burn damage, and there are better ways to stop a singular attack, which don't really see play because neither of those things are very important. And at number one, we have Magical Mallet. This is a spell card which has the effect where you can shuffle any number of cards from your hand back into your deck and then draw the same number of cards. And on surface level, this card seems very good, as it allows you to basically mulligan your hand, and a choice of returning singular cards rather than returning everything like what Reload does. 
However, you may be surprised to hear, but Reload is actually better in certain circumstances and has seen more play than Magical Mallet because it has some combo potential with certain cards. But the reason Magical Mallet is not as good as you would think is because it's an inherent minus one in card advantage. You see, whenever you count the amount of advantage a card has, you have to also count the fact that the card is going to go to the graveyard after you use it. That's why something like Pot of Greed is considered a plus one, even though it lets you draw two cards. That's because the card advantage is counted to the fact that you're losing the card from your hand in order to draw two. So, while being able to reset choice cards from your hand in order to redraw them is actually a very good effect, having to go minus one in card advantage to do it is generally not worth it, because card advantage is everything in the game. Having to play a specific card in your deck that you have to specifically draw into to have a chance to reset a dead hand is just not worth playing that card. Especially since you're basically planning for a failure stage, rather than trying to plan for a way to advance the game state. I've had many streams where people would come on and suggest that I add Magical Mallet in order to deal with Garnets that I draw into my deck. As of course a Garnet is a card that you never want in your hand and you want to stay in your deck. And it is the ideal card in order to potentially deal with a Garnet. But that's playing a card in order to only deal with Garnets, and taking a loss in card advantage that could be used on literally anything else that could actually advance the game state. You could instead play something like Evenly Matched to single-handedly win you the game. Dark Ruler No More to turn off all of your opponent's negates. Or even an Ash Blossom and Joyous Spring to stop a key search. You have to compare this one Magical Mallet, which is only planning for a failure state, to all of these other very game-changing staples that could instead help you actually win the game. All while most of these other staple cards trading evenly, or even netting you advantageous card advantage, instead of a guaranteed minus one like what Magical Mallet will always be. Really, the easiest way they could fix the card for Magical Mallet to be as good as people think it is, is to change its effect to draw the same number of cards you return to your deck, plus one. Which is exactly what they did with some archetype specific Magical Mallets, like Ignite Reload, which allows you to shovel back Pendulum Monsters from your hand to your deck, then draw the same number of cards, plus one. Or even Sekka's Light which allows you to return a singular card from your hand to your deck and draw a card, but it does so from the graveyard, so you don't lose any card advantage. So there are cards which have good effects similar to Magical Mallet, but the only good ones that do don't lose you any card advantage for doing so. 